morning. Um, okay. And uh, welcome to the Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct meeting. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Um, Angela, could you start by taking the roll call, please? Yes. Vanola? Present. Bacon? Here. Bradley? Here. Brown? Shivers? Here. Fields? Here. Krieger? Here. Mark? Here. Mercado? Munoz? Here. O'Reilly? Here. Poindexter? Here. And Star. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. And next on the agenda is the call for public comment. So State Bar staff will try to call the members of the public in the order in which they appear. Um, so Angela, do you wanna go ahead and start with that process, please? Uh, yes, for those who are participating by Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It's a hand icon at the bottom center of your screen. If you want to address the committee, please click on that hand icon right now and State Bar staff will call on you in the order that your hands are received, uh, that your hands are raised. For those participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. This will alert the staff that you would like to make comment and we will ask you to open up your microphone to address the committee. Due to time restrictions, we can allow more than two minutes for each speaker. Staff will have an on-screen timer visible to all attendees during the duration of your public, com public comment. The timer's two minute countdown will start when you start your comment and you will be given a 30 second warning. So if there are any attendees wanting to make a public comment, please use the raise hand function right now. I don't see any public comments, Sarah. Okay. So since we don't have any public comments, um, I just wanted to um, say a couple of brief remarks about the recent ethics symposiums, which we haven't met since then. And to thank everyone who participated in the Ethics Symposium as a panelist or moderator, I've received some great feedback um, from the symposium, and I appreciate everyone's hard work, especially staff's work in making it possible. Um, and I also, um, I know that Ken, that AI panel that you moderated, um, I consider, I am um, speaking with another regulatory organization I'm a member of, CCPUC, and uh, they were also interested in considering a similar uh, AI panel for uh, their next annual meeting. Um, so I just wanted to mention that briefly. Um, and I don't know if anyone else wanted to talk about the ethics symposium at all. Um, but if not, I wanted to just move on to approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll and second. a second. Second. Thank you. All right, I will take the vote to approve the minutes um, for the last meeting. Bacon? Um, yes. Brown? Yes. Bradley? Abstain? Chivers? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Mark? Here. Yes. Mercado? Munoz? Yes. O'Reilly? Yes. Poindexter? Yes. Star? And Benola? Yes. All right, nine in favor, so the motion carried. Thank you. And next on the agenda is the staff report. And um, I also just wanted to ask, um, as part of that staff report, if it, I think it would be nice to hear an update on, I know the, uh, the Board of Trustees meeting is on May 18th, and there's several items on the agenda that, that COPREC has previously worked on, including um, the proposed rule of professional conduct 8.3 regarding reporting attorney misconduct, the proposed civility amendments, um, so if there could be a, a brief discussion on th those items, um, I, I think some of the members of COPRAC would be interested in hearing about that. Although I know that meeting hasn't taken place, but just based on the agenda materials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Raquel, do you, you have your hand up? Did you wanna 
I do. I was not put in the main room, so I just, in terms of attendance, I was here, but I wasn't able to uh, respond, so I would just want that to be duly noted. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and yes, I do have um, apologies. This will be a longer than usual update because I do have um, some information to give you on many of the things that are coming out of the Office of Professional Competence um, for the Board of Trustees meeting, which is next Thursday and Friday, so you know. Um, so a little brief report on the Ethics Symposium just for some numbers. Um, so there were 553 attendees present. Um, and we've also gotten really good feedback as well on each of the um, programs that were offered. Um, just so you know, staff is preparing a summary of the MCLE survey feedback that we um, collect and that will be shared with the moderators and then moderators in turn, you can um, share that feedback with the panelists if you'd like to. Uh, just a housekeeping item. Um, if anyone is still having issues with SharePoint access, do please let Angela know. Um, she's been setting some meetings with um, our IT staff to hopefully get that working for everyone. Um, so just go ahead and let her know on that. Um, and then with that, I'll turn to um, a brief update on the Board of Trustees items. So there are um, four items on the agenda that are coming out of the Ex-Professional Competence for next week. Um, the first is seeking adoption of the COPRAC opinion on the ethical obligations of working remotely. We tried to prioritize other opinions and then just other COPRAC work at the board meetings over the more recently. So that we're finally getting it to um, the Board of Trustees for adoption. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's gonna be any uh, issue with that, but obviously I will let you know um, if or if not, it is adopted by the board next week. Um, other things are the recommendations from the um, Civility Task Force, and I'll go through those, and then as, of course 8.3 as well. So on the Civility Task Force, there were um, just high level, the Civility Task Force uh, made four recommendations to promote and improve civility in the legal profession. Three of those apply to attorneys. So one was to add one hour of MCLE requ uh, required credit hour for training on civility. Another was to revise the rules of professional conduct, as this committee is very aware. And then the other one was to, um, changes to the civility oath requirement to require all licensees to complete that oath. Um, so starting first with the MCLE requirement, um, that was issued for a public comment period, um, among with other changes um, concerning MCLE that we referred back on from other stakeholders. So it's one hour of MCLE on civility, uh, a change to the credit hour requirement regarding competency to allow one hour on attorney wellness, and then one hour on um, technology and the practice of law to reflect the changes to um, the duty of competence set forth in the comment. Um, so all of those we received public comment on, most of which was in support of those changes. And so those are likely to be recommended to the board of trustees. Um, another change was to expand the credit hour um, eligibility for mock trial moot court activities. Um, that was actually one that nearly every public commenter was in favor on, and we will be um, seeking a second round of public comment on that because there's minor modifications to expand it beyond just mock trial and moot court to other um, negotiation competition type activities that would um, have the similar have similar uh, requirements for obtaining legal knowledge and and skill. Um, so those are going to be going out for, or at least the mock trial component, the expansion of that is gonna be going back out for a second round of public comment. And because the MCLE rules are, they're really interrelated and they kind of all work in concert together. So we're not gonna be seeking adoption of the one hour um, civility requirement until the other changes come back from their second round of public comment. Um, on the civility oath, um, the State Bar received 60 public comments on that, uh, more than half agreeing with the proposal. Uh, we will be seeking a second round of public comment on that as well, just because of minor changes based on just implementation of the requirement. So um, what will be required most likely, and this requires Supreme Court approval, is that um, all licensees will be required to do a one-time declaration um, affirming their um, aspirational goals of committing to civility through specific language. It's in the current rule of court. Um, so that'll be a one-time requirement and then there'll be an annual requirement to just uh, affirm your um, civility obligations that will go through with your licensing um, annual obligations as well, such as CTAP and those types of things. 
Um, I'll pause there. I'm going very quickly just because there's a lot to cover, but I can pause there and answer any questions. Otherwise, I'll turn to the civility rules professional conduct. Yeah, uh, one question uh, on the uh, the mock trial credits and all that. If that gets implemented, will that be retroactive for the current year or that just going forward? No, it would be prospective. So if you have, and it, it's, um, I believe it's two hours, it's capped at two hours. So obviously, if you work, uh, if you participate in mock trial, I'm, I'm assuming everyone does more than two hours. So it'd be two hours of participatory general credit that would be offered, but um, it's a prospective. So, but for example, let's say it was adopted January 1, 2024, it would apply to that, that compliance period, which is a three-year compliance period. So two hours of which would fit in, if that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so diving into the rules of professional conduct surrounding civility. Um, so as you may recall, um, COCRAC recommended essentially um, different changes from what the civility task force recommended, um, including changes to um, several comments to the rules, um, and then also recommended that staff could explore a standalone rule. Um, at the board of trustees meeting back in November, those two things were essentially combined. So there were proposed amendments that were issued to um, comment one of rule 1.2, comment four of rule 8.4, comment six of rule 8.4, and then a new standalone rule, rule 8.4.2. So uh, we received 65 comments on those changes. Um, more than two, well, two thirds were in favor of the changes to 1.2, more than half were in favor of the changes to 8.4. Um, and then just slightly over half were in favor of the standalone rule 8.4.2. There are some um, changes that are being proposed that will require a second round public comment period. Um, the biggest of which um, is changes to limit the standalone rule 8.4.2 to incivility in the practice of law. So it's not gonna be too extended, extended to related professional activities. Um, public comment, there was a lot of feedback on that and just making sure that it was more clear that it's um, we're regulating civility, civility within the practice of law itself, as opposed to things beyond that where it gets a bit more ambiguous. Um, there are some other changes as well, but the um, Board of Trustees, the staff materials for the Board of Trustees are already posted. So unless there's specific questions on the other changes, I'd just like to turn to 8.3 for the interests of time. Okay, seeing none, <laughs> 8.3. So um, that agenda item has not yet been posted. It should likely be posted in the next few days. Um, so as you may recall, um, so COPRAC issued a, a proposed recommended 8.3 and worked very hard to get that done in a very short time frame. So thank you everyone for your participation in that. Um, so the, what was, it was, COPRAC's version was renamed as essentially alternative one because staff issued a second proposal alternative two that was a bit more expansive. Um, and then staff also solicited public comment on um, basically preferences of those public commenters. So be it to have no version of 8.3, alternative one, which was the COPRAC version, alternative two, a slightly expanded staff version, or to adopt model rule 8.0, a version of model rule 8.3. We received 390 public comments on those, um, 328 of which were submitted by attorneys and attorney organizations. Um, the majority, 199, preferred that there was no version of 8.3. Um, and then of the commenters who supported a version, um, it went in order of alternative one, alternative two, and then model rule uh, 8.3. In regards to public comment concerns about um, any version, essentially, they were very similar to a lot of the concerns that were raised by this committee, weaponization, um, concerns about disciplining an attorney who hasn't committed misconduct, but is just not reporting misconduct, um, concerns about some vagueness and what must be reported, and then concerns about retaliation by someone who makes a valid complaint, and then concerns, again, related to weaponization um, and false or malicious reporting. Comments in favor talked about um, a moral duty to report misconduct and that um, lawyers are in a better position to know if there has been misconduct or what even is misconduct than a client could be. Um, that it will create a higher disincentive for engaging in misconduct because there's a higher likelihood that you could be reported. Um, and then it could um, 
make some lawyers more comfortable with reporting because they're not choosing to report, they actually are required to do so. Um, and then um, some noted that concerns that have been raised about weaponization can be addressed by um, other rules such as rule 310, 3.10, um, and then the, four, the um, criminal penalties for false and malicious reporting set forth in the business and professions code. Um, ultimately, um, there were more comments you know, describing um, proponents and op opponents of Alt-1, proponents and opponents of Alt-2, and then same with the model rule. Um, staff is going to be seeking um, adoption of alternative two based on all of those things, as well as um, conversations with um, other stakeholders. Um, we're hoping that alternative two, based on everything else going on, strikes kind of a balance to um, protect the public, which is the ultimate goal of any version of 8.3, um, and then address some of those concerns about weaponization, um, a flood of complaints to OCTC when they should be addressing, you know, um, other um, more egregious types of misconduct and so forth. So that will be um, again at next week's Board of Trustees meeting on Thursday. I can answer any questions on that. Um, but uh, all of the changes to the rules of professional conduct, of course, and then to the civility oath will have to go to the Supreme Court for ultimate adoption. And I just, Erica, oh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I think you went over this pretty quickly, but I, I missed the reasoning for um, choosing alternative two over alternative one. Um, it seemed like the public comments, you, the order was, was the reverse, but I think there was other reasons you explained for uh, staff recommending alternative two. Yeah, so there's a few. Um, one, the public comment was predominantly attorney based. So I think we have to look a bit at the public comment that um, was um, not in favor of, of any frankly version of 8.3. The, the attorney commenters who were in favor of alternative one as it being the most narrow and compare that with some of the, the non-attorney public commenters who talked about the, the reasons to need a broader rule, um, notwithstanding obviously the concerns about wep weaponization, which are valid as well as the concerns about a higher number of complaints. Um, so we've looked at, um, we've done some research into the other jurisdictions that have a version of, well, every jurisdiction has a version of 8.3, but we've looked at some of those larger um, states and um, the number of complaints that they get from attorneys um, and whether or not there is a valid concern for the um, influx of complaints that could come to OCTC. And frankly, we just, I mean, we can look at other states' data, but that's not necessarily gonna predict what it's going to be like in California. But the other states' data isn't indicative that there is gonna be a floodgate type argument, uh, a, a floodgate that is opened, excuse me. And so it was then looking at what the ultimate goal of, of all rules of professional conduct and particularly this rule is, and that's truly to protect the public from, from lawyer harm um, by, by making that information available to, the, to OCTC and the state bar. Um, there were comments that expressed concerns with alternative one not going far enough to do that because of the types of client harm that are addressed in other areas that are um, provided for an alternative two, including dishonesty, deceit, and intentional um, and reckless mis um, misrepresentations. Um, and so, you know, balancing these concerns, recognizing the public comment that was um, in favor of alternative one and alternative two, the numbers were not frankly very far apart. Um, and so looking at that, um, and then also just, you know, we have SB 42 that's also on the, you know, out there. Um, and so looking at something that will hopefully um, balance the interests of California attorneys who are trying to do the right thing and then, you know, promote um, protecting the public from public harm. Thanks, that was helpful. And so it sounds like you did have a chance then to look at the other states' data is what you're saying too, in terms of, so that, that's, I know that was something raised at the last, um, Board of Trustees meetings, that's helpful that you're able to do that. Yeah, and that all of that information will be, this is, you know, kind of a preview, all of it will be yeah. in, the, in the item that should hopefully be, you know, posted in the next couple of days. Okay, well, thanks for that report, Erica. Does anyone else have questions? I do. I, I have a question and a disclosure, um, which staff probably already knows. I did make a public comment uh, on behalf of myself not unrelated to COPRAC. So I just want to um, make everyone just aware that I did that so you're not surprised. And I did not know if that was a practice, but I figured it was easy to, easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. 
and I felt strongly about it. So I, I went ahead and didn't make the comment un, under my name as a public citizen. Um, so that's the disclosure. Um, the second thing is about SB 42. And you just mentioned it a little bit, Erica, at the end, but I'm curious how is, how is the um, relationship building going in terms of is there, is there a sense that if uh, option two passes, they'll drop 42 or how, so a little bit of sense about where that stands. Thanks. Sure. So um, I can give a brief update on the status of SB 42 and then um, and then go from there, essentially. So SB 42 is, is still the same. There's been no changes to the language in the bill as of right now. So it still is essentially very similar to ABA model rule 8.3. Um, my understanding, and Bridget, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's moved um, from uh, the Senate side over to the Assembly side. Um, and um, that's where there could possibly be some revisions to it as of right now, just because of where it is, as far as its um, status as a bill. Um, State Bar staff has been in conversations with legislative staff on just keeping them updated on where the progress of um, the rule 8.3 is, so that they're aware of that. But I don't think we have anything definitive on whether alternative two would um, be sufficient um, in regards to the concerns that the legislature has that would result in um, moving forward with SB 42 or otherwise. It's just more right now us giving them information to know where the state bar is and its progress regarding rule 8.3. Yeah, Thank I, can you. Just, I can add Erica, that was right. I, I don't think it's actually gone off the floor yet to the assembly, but I we expect that it will and they've indicated to us they're not expecting any other amendments before it goes onto the floor for a vote in the Senate. Um, and as Erica said, we're just trying our best to communicate with the with the author's office, get hear the concerns, understand what's going on. Because as we've talked about on this in this meeting before, we would really love to avoid a situation where we have a rule that's contrary to the statute, and um, you know, working with the court as well. To so we're we're trying to balance all of these different pieces at the same time. It'll be interesting to see what the board decides to do um, next week, but. As you can imagine, as Erica is describing, we are trying to take <laughs> a lot of different comments and a lot of different feelings from a lot of different stakeholders to make the best recommendation we can. Um, and so that's how we landed on on all two as a recommendation from staff standpoint. But again, we don't know what the board will do with it and what the court will do with it, even if we do move it on to the to the to uh, the court. Bridget, um, that was my question. <clears throat> what, how, how does it work uh, if the statute if the legislature passes a statute? Then does the Supreme Court have the choice to adopt it or not? Um, or is it a cram down? What is it? Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what will happen. I don't really, I mean, theoretically, you know, we could, the, the board next week could send this to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court could adopt a rule before the legislature passes this bill. And then I don't, I don't exactly know what would happen as far as the separation of powers issues go, um, depending on the inconsistencies there. Um, we're, we're just really hoping to avoid that kind of collision course, if, if at all possible. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Joel, but I just think there's a lot of unknowns right now um, and we're trying to navigate it as best we can. Thanks. And is that the um, current recommendation that's going to be presented at the next Board of Trustees meeting to um, have alternative two go to the California Supreme Court as the next step? I think so. <laughs> I think we're still in the midst of um, yes. I, I do think that's what we're going what we're going to recommend. I don't know as far as um, I really don't know what the timing will be and what the board's preference will be as far as whether they should move it or not. And I don't know if we've really refined our staff recommendation to that point yet, um, but that is something that could happen, that the board could decide to do. And I don't know where, yeah, what they will do. Yeah, and if, I was looking at the agenda before this meeting and the line item that appeared to be the case, but it just wasn't clear because that particular material, those materials weren't yet available through the link. Yes, they will, yeah. That this was a tough turnaround, Erica. To really make yeah, you there's a lot of work. I, I, yes. I feel there were a lot of items, Erica, that you had. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Agenda. But we do think we're we're pretty far down the line on it, so I do think we should have it up uh, shortly. And, you know, we we want to really post it as far in advance of the meeting as we possibly can. So we're working hard to do that. Okay. 
Well, great. Were there any other questions about the staff report from others? So if not, um, this I do I, I do want to say something. Oh, sure. Um, regarding ethics symposium. So appreciate Erica, your both the chair and Erica, your brief report. I would, and I don't know where in the agenda where else to put it, so I'm going to drop it here. I would like us as a committee to have an ethics symposium debrief because I think it's interesting to have what people who attend it, but as the committee who put it on, um, I think us talking about you know what we thought went well, what we think places we think could improve, um, not necessarily only on that day, but overall uh, in terms of attendance, messaging, all of that. So. Um, I don't know if that's something that is planned. It didn't sound like it was. So I, I want to re request that we do it sooner than later so that our memory, you know, what we sort of what we think happened, the farther it gets away from the time, you, you actually have less of a, a, a real recall of reality. Uh, um, so, so I would like to request that we, that we uh, do that. Yeah, or, I agree, and I think that would be useful. And um, I think that's something to perhaps table for our next meeting, because by that time, the moderators should have received the, the feedback from the public um, and then could come prepared to discuss that. So, so we, we could include that as an agenda item for our next meeting. And I think that will be um, helpful for planning um, next year's symposium. So thanks for suggesting that. And I think we, we have gone into a little bit more detail in the past within each, each panel based on the feedback received. So we will definitely do that. Um, any other uh, questions relating to the staff report? So hearing none, um, I'm gonna move on to the um, item D in the agenda, um, or it's actually B1, which is um, COPRAC rule section six, responding to opinion requests. Um, and this has, um, come to our attention based on some recent opinion requests we've received. And um, I'm gonna, again, <laughs> let Erica um, lead the presentation on, on this particular agenda item. So if you wanna go ahead and start Erica, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, and you can actually put that down just for now so we can, just, so we can see everyone, I think. Um, thank you. So what we're hoping to do is essentially kind of have a, a, a combined discussion of items, um, let's see, uh, one and two. So the rule, COPRAX rules that, um, for those who aren't aware, COPRAX rules are derived from various board resolutions that have occurred over the years. Um, they're accessible on the State Bar's website. They're a bit buried. Um, so rule six is basically what we're gonna be looking at today, but um, you know we can send a link so that you all are aware of where the rules are. Um, located, but they are essentially kind of an amalgamation of um, different resolutions that have been issued by the Board of Trustees throughout COPRAC's lifetime. Um, so, you know, quite some time. And what we are looking at, and the reason this is tied to the next agenda item, is we are receiving more and more um, requests for opinions, or we're being made aware of more topics that may require, um, that are one, ever-changing, and so a, a COPRAC opinion that we can be working on, um, that you are working on very diligently, um, can be you know, public, uh, posted for public comment or um, adopted by the board, by RAD, um, Board of Trustees. And then you know, six months later, it, it may not be relevant anymore after you know, years of work on it, if not longer. And so the current rules are somewhat limited in what COPRAC can do. So you can issue formal opinions, which is the process that you are all very familiar with. Um, letter opinions, which to my knowledge have not been used um, with any frequency or if ever um, over the past 10 plus years um, or decline to address a topic. And those are kind of the three choices. So that is where the rules exist right now. And what I, hope the committee can kind of look at and talk on is some of the big topics that are that are in um, the profession right now. So, um, you know, there's artificial intelligence as is posted on the agenda, um, which is, you know, you look at an article from three weeks ago and it's not current anymore. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's been a lot of issues with, um, you know, 
banking industry and, and how that may affect, you know, IOLTA accounts, client trust accounts with um, some banks that are having to be, um, you know, uh, that are maybe going under or needing to be rescued. Um, and so concerns surrounding that. And then we have just, you know, a, a regular opinion topic request that had some urgency to it. And, um, you know, whether or not our formal opinion process is something that that, that would work well for or not. Um, there's actually two of those that I think we'll be taking up. Um, one from um, related to 8.3 um, and then another one. And so I just wanted to set the kind of the stage and then invite all of COPRAC to kind of talk about, um, you know, possible changes that um, you may want to, to think about and consider. And then if that's the case and any of those want to be moved forward, you know, um, looking at whether or not the committee would want to propose changes to the current COPRAC rules to allow for a bit more um, agility in, in some of the uh, advice that, that COPRAC provides to, to licensees. Yeah, uh, you know, thinking about it, I think it's, particularly since these are cited uh, from years back uh, and they're part of our long, uh, history and lore of thinking that it's better to get it right than to get it fast. But uh, that said, if there could be some kind of process for uh, emergency temporary advice or something like that that would expire or wouldn't be uh, binding until we uh, come out with a formal opinion after the normal process, that might work. Those are my two thoughts. So, Erica, in terms of the agenda item and what you're seeking to do with it here, are you wanting us to make decisions, give input? I realize I'm not, I, I didn't know what, what the agenda item was. So if it's to get into any meaningful dialogue, I'm probably not as prepared. I read it and I had, you know, I have some thoughts, but I didn't know why you had it. On here, other than we have, in my opinion, way too many outstanding things on our docket. So I thought, oh, maybe she's going to help us focus, <laughs> you know, items that are on a list since 2017. But but I realize it, it may be that, but also it sounds a little broader. So it could be helpful. And then I, uh, based on what you say, would be able to be more focused on what I'd say. Oh. Sure. Um, so I think this is one of hopefully several conversations that we're hoping to have. I don't think we're expecting, you know, here's what we want the changes to the COPRAC rules to be. Staff take it to the board at next week's board meeting. One, we couldn't do that because of um, Bagley Keen restrictions. But two, I think we're hoping to be a lot more thoughtful in this process. So this is just an, an initial conversation about are there changes that make sense for, for COPRAC structure um, to, you know, um, continue to have formal opinions. I, I, I do think, you know, we're, that's not something we're trying to suggest should ever, or at least at this time, go away because of, you know, that's, that has been COPRAC's work for forever. Um, and so I think that we're just hoping to have a conversation about um, alternative ideas or additional ideas to what COPRAC structure currently is, um, recognizing also that, you know, this committee is made up of volunteers. And so uh, the, the workload, you know, we're not trying to say, COPRAC, please do a lot more as volunteers. I think we're trying to explore um, other things that can be done and ways for staff to work with COPRAC to accomplish those things, um, to, um, you know, just to, to support attorneys in their practice, um, you know, within California. I know that COPRAC opinions are looked to outside of California as well. So to Joel's point, I don't think we're trying to say that we want to move so quickly we would be wrong in anything, but I do think that we want to look at ways that we can be um, perhaps less um, reactive to things that actually want to be opined on. There may be things that are not always going to be things that COPRAC frankly wants to take on, but I do think we're just looking at um, you know this initial discussion being more of a brainstorm type session to look at um, you know ideas. Um, I've worked with other committees that advise on, on ethics issues. So I have, you know, I, if, if this committee doesn't 
I can suggest ideas just to talk on. Um, not that I necessarily think they're the best or the greatest ideas, but just to, you know, further the conversation. But that's the point of today is just to kind of have a brainstorm on different ideas. Erica, is there is there any confidentiality concern with talking about the request that um, I generated some feedback to you and some frustration? Is there can we just talk about that or is there any reason why that can't be discussed in this meeting? So it's a publicly filed, that request is a publicly filed document in a, um, in a pending case. So I think, um, I think we can certainly talk about the topic. I'm not sure we want to necessarily reference the underlying um, yeah. facts. As you'll see in the posted agenda material, some of that has been redacted just to protect the, oh, the privacy sure. of the individuals. Okay. Yeah, and just Brandon, that, that information is on the, um, one of the agenda items. I think it's the proposed request five perhaps. So if you wanted to talk about it, maybe that would be okay. a good way to like bring it up on the screen. If you wanted to discuss that, I, I think it is request number five of the new opinion um, request for consideration. Right. So, okay. Um, I'm not sure if, it, if we could share that on the, on the screen. Angela or Mimi, but it, did you want to talk about that now, Brandon? Well, only in the sense that the particular um, urgent and fundamental concerns there um, caused me to be to be frustrated with uh, our inability to be more nimble and quickly responsive if we wish to be. I'm not sure the whole committee would even want to jump in, but that particular request dealt with, uh, you know, death penalty issues. And um, I'm trying to read that to figure out how much we can talk about. Um, yeah, so it's a death row inmate. It's a confidentiality issue where an attorney um, wanted, and the court actually instructed the attorneys to seek guidance from us as to confidentiality obligations pertaining to a death row inmate's appeal. So, you know, we can all speculate in our minds as to what information it is the attorney may or may not have that the attorney may or may not want to share. But my reaction to this was like, wow, that's like the most important ethics issue I've ever seen. But as our rules currently stand, we don't really have the ability to respond directly quickly and specifically to this person. And maybe we're not the right body to do it. Maybe there's other alternatives, but that was part of my interest in sort of looking at these rules a bit. That, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Is that so vague? Have I been so vague that I'm not being useful? I'm not sure. No, that's helpful. I, I, yeah. I, cause I, and if I could piggyback on that and, and maybe I'm missing something obvious from this section six here, but I was trying to understand, I get from a formal opinion perspective, that there might that there's a view that we couldn't respond to that because it relates to pending litigation, so that would be covered by B two. But maybe maybe this is a question for Erica, with respect to the private letter opinion. It doesn't have that same exception that we can't issue a private letter opinion because of pending litigation, and so is there some other reason why when we get requests like this. That have some urgency, we we couldn't issue a private letter opinion to the requester. Um, so I think oh, was someone sorry, I thought I heard someone else. <laughs> it's just my, uh, me. Um, so I think let me um I want to pull up the rules in concert to look at all of them. But I believe what um what we had talked about is that um let's see. So the letter opinions, um it seems, at least to me, that it, if you look at the second, let's see, it's the second full sentence, the committee typically issues letter opinions when there's no policy reason for the committee to decline to comment. I think the policy reason is those one through seven above that we would normally be declining to comment on. Um, but that's certainly we could something we could look into more. Well, I would know. Um, I'm and sorry. To it's, not, it's not simple routine or otherwise, you know, it's it's reading that whole sentence collectively, I think. It's it's there's an and within that as well. And I don't think that it really necessarily fits within right. that. 
Well, so you've got a, a room of, of a lot of lawyers here virtually, and I think some of us who could could argue the contrary point, and it's really not clear, frankly, it's kind of vague language, probably didn't contemplate getting that type of um, serious request and what that would mean. And, and sure. So, so I'm not, and that's, I'm not at all criticizing you, you didn't draft this, um, but that's kind of what struck me. Like if that's what's meant that we have to consider you know, B1 through seven in deciding whether we can do a private letter opinion, um, then that seems to be kind of the, the, the issue that we're, that we're really facing here is that we're constrained by, assuming that's the right interpretation, we're constrained by providing more immediate responses via private letter request as a practical matter because it's going to be situations where somebody has some kind of exigency and probably B1 through seven might apply. So I guess the question would be, you know, to what extent um, the board, COPRAC members, et cetera, would feel comfortable loosening B1 through seven to the extent they need to be loosened for us to have a broader purview for private letter requests. I think that's one, one thing to explore. And then just, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember where this came up. You know, another way for us to be more immediate is is obviously publishing articles um, as as members of of COPRAC through um, through the process of COPRAC. I think I published the last like news article, MCLE article, through that process that we used to have, and that must have been about four years ago. And then for whatever reason, it stopped. And so that's another way where we can tackle issues with some immediacy um, and, and get our messaging out um, to, to the public in, in a way that can be helpful. And, and I think those were set up to have MCLE credit. And so it was also a, a further plug for COPRAC, uh, as I recall. And then I'll just say, and then I'll be quiet. Um, you know, one, one thing philosophically for me, I've always felt like our opinions have started to get too long over the last five or six years. And that you know, we look back 15, 20 years ago, our opinions were much shorter to the point and probably could be issued a lot quicker. And so I would, you know, just philosophically, I would be in favor of us trying to have on our docket issues that we can tackle more nimbly um, to, you know, get get the messaging out to the public on, on issues uh, that we obviously think are important enough to opine on. Um, it, it, not to say that we should stop issuing long opinions, but but certainly have foreground in our mind um, ways to shorten the the, the drafting process um, where we can. Um, anyway, those are my those are my stream of consciousness thoughts. If I may just add to, to what Justin was saying about how a lot of important issues might fall into those bullet points, you know, one through seven, this particular issue of a death row inmate, an attorney with confidential information trying to figure out his or her, uh, the bounds of the duty of confidentiality under those circumstances, um, that's only going to come up in litigation and it's an important issue. And so I, so I feel the pinch of that constraint, um, unless there is some other part of the state bar or ethical committee that is unconstrained and can, you know, help these folks that are trying to figure out the right course of action. Yeah. And I, I also think, you know, with the split recently, and there, there's now the California Lawyers Association that perhaps could issue an ethics opinion in this type of situation. But I think, um, but Justin was raising um, kind of points to potential revisions to, I, I would think, subsection C, because this type of issue that was raised in this opinion request is something um, that is not simple or routine, and it is a, a general interest of a, the way the rule is currently written. We couldn't do the private um, response, so it seems like we would want to be able to do so in this type of situation. Um, so. I would think that that would be potential amendment to consider. But I, I wanted to, I see Raquel's hand has been raised for a while. So I wanted to call on Raquel um, 
her feedback or question. Thanks. Okay, Erica, where are you? There you are. So take me back to you ref when you were speaking, you referenced the statement. Where where exactly is that statement about policy? And that was a defining statement. Um, so I think we're looking at we're looking at rule six, which is long or section six. Um, right. I have I have that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think we're talking about within um, section C or paragraph C letter opinions. Okay. So mm -hmm. And so what typically has been done by I see it. I okay. see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do, you were talking and I'm like, okay, but we're yeah, no problem. <laughs> so the letter the committee typically issues letter opinions when there is no policy reason for the committee to decline. That's correct. That was, but that's that that's the sentence you were reading. And I just didn't know where it was. So yeah. I just so I got it. I set that aside. Great. Um, um so I think there is in 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 all section six doesn't doesn't really reference the idea of the timeliness. So I do think that timeliness is is great. You could have a great opinion, but if it comes after the time that you need it, it doesn't add any value. And so the death penalty one seems like that's a, a, a case. So I don't I don't necessarily I mean in that case is someone's life. So there's an urgency, but the over the overarching thing is that it just needs to be timely because you may get something that isn't death related, but the timing of when it happens, when they get the opinion makes all the difference to you know that the disposition of whatever the situation is so I, so i think timeliness is uh, is our criteria um i do think and i think so for you know i, I appreciate brandon bringing that one out because i do think that is of a different order than the, the typical ones on the list um and so i do think there is my observation and i say it uh, with all deference to those who are working on the opinion, there isn't, uh, doesn't, the, the cadence of how we're doing them does not seem to be effective. So we work, we, you know, it's probably starting from the very beginning, which is people volunteer to do it. And it's almost like if no one volunteers, then, then the, the um, request just lie flat. And I think that that's an issue because I don't think it's, I don't think the value is based on the committee's interest in taking it up and actually having people say, hey, I wanna do it. I think the value has to be that the committee thinks that this is of general interest to the bar and the public. Like that's the standard for the decision to be made. And then we say, okay, so therefore if we agree that this, I'm just gonna take the death penalty one, this meets that criteria, then we set about it. And I think we need to give ourselves time, timelines, because I feel like we just let them, you know, a little work is done and, and it's this idea that we're volunteering and so therefore it's okay to not have an effective cadence. And I just think it that goes against the idea of what we're really trying to do, which is provide counsel of public interest. So for me, we could do lots of machinations with with you know the the this document, but I really do think in some way it's it's our process. And from the way we start to include, I, I do believe the um the the way the opinions are formed. I do that. I mean, I think 11 pages to get to 11 pages takes a lot. And I think on the other side, it's not particularly accessible to the people who we're trying to give it to. So you have to be really motivated to read that. Uh, and the idea is that if they're if they are things that we're trying to get the not only the attorneys but the public to be better informed, it's got to be more digestible. Um, for them to do it otherwise, you know, they're, they're just, you know, we're putting a lot of energy, but I'm not sure people are actually um, overall having the benefit of the work either. So I think it's more to do with us than, than, than in some way, whatever the documentation says, um, is my, sort of my top 
my observation from, you know, how many ever months I've been on the committee, which is a lot less than everyone else, but also not being an attorney. Also, I probably have a different line of, of uh, sight. I mean, I read them, I understand them, but I think, wow, I'm only reading them because I'm on the committee. If I was an attorney, I probably, if it was something I needed to do what I was doing, I'd read them, but everyone else, all the other ones, I just put them on the side for later, over. Thanks Raquel for that feedback. Um, and I, you know, I do like the suggestion you made in terms of if we're considering revisions to have them tied to the urgency of a particular matter and the, and the timeliness. But I, I see there's a bunch of hands raised. So um, er Erica, maybe I'll start with you. I, I see your hands raised. I'll let, let's let Cassie go just because she was up before me. <laughs> okay, gotcha, got sorry. <laughs> I'm not paying close attention. Go ahead, Cassidy, thanks. I'll be quick. Um, I just have a question about the whole death penalty urgency type of thing. Are we talking about like a hotline service that, you know, that we would be providing in responding to a, a particular in inquiry that has this type of urgency? Because that seems um, impractical. Um, and then we, there are, you know, I mean, I know that there's the ethics hotline that the state bar has, but I know that's not all that um, helpful. And then the other thing I want to point out on that front is that, um, because this is what I do as part of my practice, is that there are a, a number of insurance companies that provide these type of ethics. Um, we don't want to call them hotline services, but consultation services, where if you have, if you're insured by a particular insurer, you can talk to an ethics lawyer about a particular issue and so this you know criminal defense lawyer if they have that particular insurance they could you know utilize that program um so there are you know services outside of the bar that you know it particularly what can address you know particular ethics questions that that are urgent and that's you know what i do um as part of my practice so um and then the other thing i just want to piggyback on justin Justin's comments and Raquel's comments too is that yeah, I agree. I think that we there should be some way we can um, can respond to inquiries, um, not in an you know emergency basis, but you know particular inquiries. I mean, I like reading those opinions in other from other states where it's you know inquiry inquirer asks blah 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 question, and the opinion is really short and it's really you know easy to read and practical and it's in it and it's something that um i think would benefit you know our our the membership of the bar um and i agree with raquel that you know the, it just takes a long time for us to get our opinions written and done and i think maybe we need a little bit more structure so those are my com uh, comments thanks cassidy um erica did you want to speak Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of open up the conversation a little bit more. So I, I really want, um, you know, there's no real idea off limits to a certain extent. So, um, you know, we're talking about expediting opinions, uh, changing how opinions are written, and all of those things, you know, we're talking about in a committee of volunteers again. Um, and so, you know, exploring um, staff resources, for example, internally to the state bar, I think is something that we could also explore. Um, at least maybe for some of the more urgent opinions. Um, so I come from working for a, a committee where all the opinions were actually staff drafted as opposed to committee drafted. Um, and that's not to say that the committee was not incredibly involved in the opinions. It was just that, you know, writing takes time and researching takes time. And so having, it's, you know, it's much easier to edit and add to as we do in these meetings um, than it is to, to start from scratch. Um, and so I think that that's something that could also be explored, you know, certainly not for every opinion, but, um, you know, if there are some opinions that kind of need something to be um, handled with more immediacy, I think that's something that could be part of the conversation. Um, also just, um, you know, we, we do have the formal opinions that go through the formal opinion process. I think uh, to Cassidy, kind of to your point, there's, you know, there's two extremes, right? There's the ethics hotline type type service, which is a phone service, and um, other uh, state bars also offer that and other, you know, um, for those that are, um, uh, you know, insurance providers provide it, there's, it comes in a host of different ways. 
Um, and that can oftentimes be a, you know, a real like quick and dirty, like it's here are the authorities, but it's just very high level um, and quick. And then on the other extreme is the um, COPRAC opinions that, you know, oftentimes can be 10 to 20 pages almost um, that take years. And so perhaps um, exploring a middle ground where we, we keep those formal opinions for, for law that doesn't change very often or that may change um, or that, but requires just more to it because of the complicated nature of it. Um, and then, you know, just ideas from other, from other areas that I've seen, there's, you know, in, informal opinions or, or um, you know, that are approved by, you know, a, a working group and, and having the appropriate disclaimers, obviously, to say that this was, you know, uh, created with three people, it's not, it's not COPRAC's full opinion, it hasn't been approved by the Board of Trustees, those types of things associated with it, but to um, address the fact that there are individuals who need this kind of um, guidance and advice, um, and more than just one that would get it from a hotline directly, right, where it's an issue that does have applicability to more than one, where we really want to be helping um, as many attorneys as we can with an issue that um, clearly may not, uh, may not be applicable to everyone, but applicable to enough that it's something that would warrant COPRAC weighing in on it. Yeah, I like the idea of the informal opinion um, process. Um, I think that that's a, a good middle, middle ground approach. And I've seen that in other state bars. Yeah, I've also seen that in some local bar associations too. So I, I do think that's a process we, we should consider. Um, and Joel, did you wanna offer suggestions too? I see your hands been raised. Yeah, listening to the, the comments, uh, one defense of our process is that in the last several meetings, we've been sidetracked by uh, higher demands from other things like the 8.3 and the civility, and we're asked to weigh in on these other things. And I recall a couple of our agendas in the past months that I got hijacked for that, but uh, I don't say that to excuse myself from being one of the major procrastinators. but. Um, also, I'm hearkening back to some of the debates that we've had on some of these things about the hypotheticals, which seem to really extend these um, opinions. That having been said, uh, you can imagine uh, an emergency process where such a request would come in, leadership would organize a three-member subcommittee of people who are known to have familiarity in that area, with a deadline, they would issue a response within that deadline, which would be non-citable and confidential or something. And then once that solves the emergency, a decision could be made whether that then goes on to the regular calendar for a formal opinion. So some variation of that seems to me it might make sense. I would be interested in hearing those who haven't haven't chimed in yet. What's what's your take on all that we're talking about? Just to hear some other voices. Over. Uh, I'll be a new voice. Um, I th I'm trying to think as 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 we're talking through this, what would qualify as the um, type of emergent issue that Joel just described, because. I, I, I know that people ask questions and they want something that is basically citable that they can take into court to use with the authority of COPREC behind them to resolve something. And that's not gonna happen in any short-term basis, obviously. You know, so there's that trap. If we get caught doing something that is somehow definitive, it takes a long time. And if it's not definitive or can't be cited, then why do they get wanted in the first place, right? Yeah, um, uh, Daniel, that was one of my thoughts is really what, where does one set the bar for emergency? It's right. kind of difficult. And uh, But take, I, take remote work, like it, remote work is, an, is not urgent, but it is current. And it's something that people are managing right now. And that's something that isn't life or death, but we could sketch out a lot of, you know, details related to that in a very sort of informal way. That would be useful to people that doesn't have to be a, a formal opinion and 
And that might be an example of something that's an intermediate question that's current, but not urgent, right? Yeah, also the, the citability issue is something that have to be worked through. Could it be uh, citable to the specific requester or a court or something? You'd have to work that out too. Yeah, I mean, I think people are going to try to cite to it. We always try to, whether it was supposed to be cited to or not. You get it somehow in front of a judge if it's an authoritative body like this, that's gold, right? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, th I think that'd be difficult to um, enforce in, in any way. Um, Bridget, I, I see you have your hand raised if you want to weigh in. Yeah, sure. I mean, some of the things that I've been thinking about with this is like, for instance, chat GPT, like we are getting so many questions. How do, what do we, can we, should we use chat GPT or not? You know, less about like taking it into court and using it, although I understand your point, Daniel, about that. But more like thinking about it as a public protection agency, trying to really help attorneys navigate some sticky things that are coming through, like what is our best, and I don't know if it's a new word, like guidance or, you know, it's not a formal opinion, but something that we can be, you know, like Erica was mentioning, we had this issue when that the Silicon Valley Bank closed, and then what are the lawyer's responsibilities with that? I mean, it's hard because of course, and especially with this group, I mean, you are trained to think about like every possible scenario and, you know, we want to make sure everything's particular, perfectly accurate before we put it out. And I, but kind of balancing that with like, here's, here's, here are the rules. Here's our best thinking about it. This is an evolving thing. Maybe it's something that will turn into a formal opinion or something more formally citable, but, you know, just something to be helpful a little bit in guiding people in their in their work as their and attorneys in California as they're navigating these issues. It's just kind of what I'm thinking, even if it's like a bulletin. And as Erica said, we're thinking this could really be staff, you know, we could have the advice and from, I don't know, a subcommittee or, you know, different people from COBRA because we want to have the expertise, but not burden you with coming up with like things on the fly all the time. We're just trying to think from a staff standpoint, how can we organize ourselves to put out, I don't know, a, a little monthly bulletin or an ethics alert or some kind of thing when these big, but as we say, we chat GPT, as Erica said, it'll, whatever we say will be, <laughs> will be out of date in like three weeks, you know? So it's, it's like, yeah. the, but yet so valuable and so important for us. And I think as a state, you know, to be the leaders on this and to really be trying to help people with, there's no way we could wait for an ethics opinion that would be at all helpful in that kind of situation. So that's so what we've what... been thinking about. <laughs> I mean, taking your example of the AI example, just the chat GPT thing, very current. It sounds like what we would be thinking of is something that just kind of identifies for people issue spotting, like things yeah. to be aware of, because that's yeah. one of the things that people need at this point. Yeah. For remote work and other things that are very current, they don't necessarily need an answer, but I think it'd be helpful to say what rules or issues are even implicated by like AI, right? Yes. That yes. could be done relatively quickly. I think so okay. too. And I think that's something staff could really take the laboring or on it just with advice from, you know, certain people in COPRAC or something, but just kind of, but it is like thinking about a new system and a new concept for how we're, how we're building it. You know, with, with that kind of stuff, I mean, we haven't done it for a while, but, you know, COPRAC used to have the ethics hotliner. Yeah, that was that's what was used to kind of deal with these kinds of things, you know, that are hot topics, issue spotting. Um, you know, it was you know we that was used when the uh, uh, opinion regarding modifying fee agreements was 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 shot down, but it addressed that. So I, it, it seems to me that's something we can do. It hasn't really been done in the last few years though, but. That's probably a good forum for that, and that gets out to everybody. That's great. Yes, that's a, that's exactly the type of thing that we were talking about, and wanted to really hear ideas from this group as you're thinking about just kind of help. You know, we can always develop things out too as we as we continue talking about it. But really wanted to hear from you all some thoughts about it. What is the hotliner? That's a publication that used to be done by Copra. Uh, yeah, it was Eric, online. As an online article, basically, um, that was um, it, it, some were written by staff, some were written written by Coprac, at least my understanding of it. 
Um, and then, you know, it's the same thing, just like Coprock opinions at the very end, there's the, this is, you know, advisory only, it's non-binding, you know, obviously, you know, with Coprock opinions, if it's cited in a, in a decision, it, it has a lot, it then become, could become binding, but yeah. um, the same concept that, you know, it's not necessarily going to, if, if you are engaged in some sort of misconduct, that's not going to necessarily get you out of it by holding up this Coprock opinion, be it whatever form, right. be it a hotline or article, or even a formal opinions, you know. To yeah, we sort of think of it as like you're identifying the problem and not really providing any specific solutions. But it would be like Ken's panel on AI, for example, to use that example. They, they raised a bunch of issues that I had never thought of before. And it would be something that just orients you in a particular topic, potentially. Well, that was my question was, um, well, it's been a lot of years since I did it, but a couple of times I've called the ethics hotline. Um, a lot of it was, you might look here or, you, you know, that kind of thing. What resources does the current ethics hotline have or use to respond? And then how could we think about supplementing that or incorporating something else into that? So. Sure. So I think I, I can speak to that briefly if that's okay, Sarah. So um, the hotline currently, what they do is they, um, the same thing that they have essentially done for quite some time in the sense that they provide research assistance. So if someone calls with an ethics question, let's take AI, for example, they would cite to the rules that may be applicable. Um, they, if they uh, call or gives a fact pattern, they will listen to the fact pattern. They may ask follow-up questions to clearly, you know, because oftentimes people call and they don't really, they think they have an ethics question, but they think it might be a conflicts question and it's not, it's something completely different. Um, or they think they have an attorney confidentiality question um, and it is actually a conflicts question, right? Or a loyalty question. And so it's looking at, it's taking the facts that are provided, asking follow-up questions, and then guiding them to the rules, um, any case law, and then relevant ethics opinions, and citing those. And if there's, um, you know, uh, if there's information in those opinions, they can obviously give that, but they are not giving advice. Um, and so they are giving basically the authorities and telling them, you know, go read these and then make your own determination as to what to do, unless it's something that's very obvious. Like, I just, you know, my client just fired me. What do I have to do with the file? Like that's something that the ethics hotline answers because it's the case law and rules and everything else are very clear on that. But if it's more of a, let's just call it a, a gray issue or a squishier issue, they just provide the relevant authorities on that. And um, why, why is that inadequate for what we're talking about? Or is it inadequate? Yeah, so I don't think it's necessarily inadequate where there's a very specific uh, factual question right involved. But the ethics hotline is it's, it's um, a very small staff of the state bar. And frankly, some people don't feel necessarily comfortable calling it or reaching out to it because it's part of the state bar. And so as opposed to requiring the um, individual who needs assistance to come directly to us, um, everything at the hotline is confidential, of course, but they still have to you know, call or identify themselves in some capacity just by you know, picking up a telephone or sending an inquiry or what have you. Um, some people don't feel comfortable with that. Um, and so that's why, you know, they may reach out to their local bar association instead or otherwise. But I think what we're trying to talk about here is those issues of more general applicability, right? That's already in rule six, where we, um, COPRAC doesn't opine on things that, that aren't of general relevance or broader relevance. And a lot of the topics, I mean, COPRAC gets called, or I'm sorry, the hotline gets calls that, um, that are frequent flyers, right? They're frequent questions that they answer all the time. Um, maybe just because someone hasn't gone to look at COPRAC's opinions. Um, or there's just a new thing, like when the um, Silicon Valley happened, we got a lot of calls on that. Um, and um, internally staff, you know, did a, a very, very brief FAQ on what to do, but something that could be maybe more robust than that, and then have the backing of, of COPRAC, I think would be valuable to a lot of licensees. And Mimi, I know you've had your hand raised, so if you want to uh, weigh in, I would appreciate it. Oh no, like my, I, this is kind of not off topic, but it was just a very more simple solution, which is maybe we should just take on less opinions. Right now we have 13 opinions on the agenda. Back when I started at the state bar, I don't know, over 15 years ago, that time we only had seven opinions on the agenda. And, you know, we, and even seven would oftentimes take a lot of time, but what that mean, meant was we could spend more time on each opinion during the meeting. And so we got more traction, you know, it, it wasn't like right now where our schedule is set up that we only have 45 minutes, 30, so oftentimes 30 minutes to talk about an opinion. 
where, you know, we can, you know, if we spent dedicated more time to each opinion because we had less opinions on the agenda, that would allow for us to do other things like maybe review little hotline or articles or do other things. But us continuing to add new topics to our agenda isn't going to make more opinions come out faster. And so, and also I, I want to also, um, someone had mentioned that the old opinions were shorter and more to the point. And I think those were just as effective. I mean, some, we, I've heard people say, how am I supposed to read a 20 page opinion? We have opinions, I think one or a couple, a couple opinions that are over 10 pages. 10 pages is a lot to read, especially when not, you know, especially when like someone had mentioned, there are three different scenarios. Do we really need all three different scenarios? Can we come up with one scenario where you take the rule and it can be applied to other types of situations, but at least the interpretation of the rule is provided to whoever's reading. So I'm, I, I, I agree with a lot of uh, the points that were made by other committee members. And I think there are simple solutions that we could look at as well to try to get some of our opinions published quicker. Thanks, Amy. I, I do like that um, suggestion too, because I, I do think oftentimes, um, I think COPRAC members do feel overwhelmed with the number of items that are on the agenda um, or the assignment agenda in particular. And, um, it's hard to stay on top of everything and prioritizing just key opinions so we have time to do other um, things like a bulletin or alert would be very useful. Um, and one thing that, I mean, I, I know we've been, had a lot of suggestions here and I, I think we should talk a little bit about um, maybe logistics next steps. Um, it sounds like many are in favor of the idea of it, you know, doing again the ethics hotline or ethics alert type articles. Um, and I know from my participation on the Bar Association of San Francisco's Legal Ethics Committee, at every meeting, we have a, a sheet, a volunteer sheet for people who want to do an ethics alert on a, on a topic. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I defer a little bit to state bar staff on this. It, it sounds like we might be able to have some state bar staff support with the, with the ethics hotliner um, in terms of maybe kind of memo or outline to get us started on an alert. And I also like the idea of maybe not having it, all, although in the local bar association I'm on, it falls on one individual. I think that's very difficult. So I think it would be helpful to get a, 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 at least two, two members um, to sign up for the hotline along with the support of one state bar staff member. Um, I think that might facilitate uh, getting these out faster on, on urgent issues or, or um, being timely. So that would be my suggestion. Um, Can I just mention something, something along those lines in the past, and I don't know who was around then besides me, maybe, um, what they, when we used to do those small um, MC, MCLE articles that were suggested or mentioned earlier, basically what we had done was the reason, why, and just to clarify, the reason why those went away was that the Cal Bar Journal, where it used to be published, was no longer being public, being written or provided. So that's why we lost a place for those to go. But before what we had done is there used to be a subcommittee and we called it an um, outreach and article subcommittee. Basically, it was just a way for us to have people who we basically put up a schedule. And if you wanted to volunteer for a month and we don't have to have a set schedule, it could be quarterly even if you want to. Yeah. But if there's a topic you already want, just you know, put it in the queue and let us know, hey, I'm working on this article. I would write to write, like to write something on this topic. I expect it'll be done by this date. you know. So then we can put it on the agenda for the committee to review in the future, but we could have a sign-up sheet. That's what we used to do in the past. You know, We would do it either monthly or quarterly and just have a running list going of people who said, so they create a deadline from this for themselves ahead of time oh I think I can have an article ready by June on this topic and just let the committee know so I'm just saying that's a possibility but that's helpful to know and just another question follow up on that Mimi so once the the subcommittee or group would then reach the the final uh draft of the, the article how soon would it be posted is there another process that would have to take place that took place before like is it discussed at a COPRAC meeting first and then published or could it go right to publication so what we have done in the past is it would come to the committee and people can give feedback, just, you know, just additional yeah. feedback, you know, say to the author, hey, you know, it'd be great if you, you know, mentioned this, this resource or this, um, this case or this, you know, reference any type of rule or whatever that they have missed. But it's not something that needs to go to the board for approval or out for public comment because it's just an article. Oh, okay, that's helpful. Um, Raquel, did you want to weigh in as well? 
Uh, yes, a couple of things. I still would love to heal from Bill and Hunter, Vikita, Elizabeth. I'm not sure if Elizabeth's actually there because her picture's only on, so I'm not sure. Um, but I, I would really like to hear, and I see Hunter has his, turned his mic on, Vikita turned her mic on, so I'll be quiet and I'll come back after those two speak. Over. Yeah, and I, thanks, Raquel. And I, I, I always think it's great to hear from everyone. So I appreciate you trying to solicit that input. I, I do know that that Elizabeth has some other urgent priorities today. So she's multitasking a little bit. So she might not be available to provide feedback. But um, if there's anyone else who hasn't spoken yet, um, we do welcome your feedback. So sure. I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll jump in. This is Vikita. And you know, and I'm fairly new to the committee. So bear with me. So I think one of the things, uh, questions that I had, which I raised my hand and I took it down and I raised it again and I took it down for the simple fact that Daniel came right in and said some of the things that I was going to say as well as Joel is, uh, Joel indicated as well. Um, so just to make sure I'm getting an understanding, um, the hotline, is it a telephone number that they're calling in like the ethics committee that would be for COPRAC? Correct. Okay. So, okay, let me just clarify. So the hotline is staffed by state bar staff. So it's not COPRAC members that okay. um, an attorney calls. It, it's it's state bar staff that have been hired and trained by other state bar staff to provide this um, uh, research assistance. Okay, perfect. And then so at that point in time, wh what happens with the information once it's gone through the hotline and that staff has reviewed it? Okay. So what happens on the ethics hotline is there's no like, there's no that's it in the sense that so an attorney calls um i used to i used to stop the hotline so what they would do is they would call they would talk to me i would give um they would tell me their legal issue um we would you know have a conversation i may ask follow-up questions and i tell them okay you need to look at rule um this is for the older rules but you need to look at rule 5.4 or you need to right. look at you know um special duties of prosecutor whatever is, is applicable and then starting with the rule and then kind of filtering down to relevant uh, coprac opinions case law etc and that's the end of the conversation um when they call if they have follow-up questions under the current model they would call again and they um could say you know i want to talk to erica because i already talked with her um or they can just talk to somebody else um, and they would get, you know, they could ask follow up questions and say, I was given these authorities, or they could start from scratch and see if, you know, you, we don't necessarily know on the hotline, see if someone else gives them different um, authorities. But that's the entire, that's, that's the whole thing, um, if that's helpful. Sure. And so for COPRAC, if we were to establish this particular hotline, this would be done for these opinions only? So I think the, what we're talking about is it's the hotliner, which is just the name of what it was called. Okay. Um, so the hotliner isn't actually a hotline, like a phone assistance or anything. It's just articles, essentially. Okay. I didn't about. hear the hotliner. I was like, okay, wait a minute. Something, there's a disconnect here. There's a phone call where you call and get some information. And then there's some articles that you're posting. How are you posting articles from a hotline? That just, there was that, dis <laughs> there's that disconnect. But for me, you know, in listening to all of the comments and all of the information and reading the information, number one, I would agree with, uh, I think it was, I don't know, Joel or Daniel, how are you going to define emergency, right? What's, what's going to classify as emergency? And then once you have all of that information, I think a subcommittee, two or three people at the most would kind of go through and provide some guidance and then submit that information. I think Mimi said it first or whoever, um, submit that information to, to the committee itself to evaluate it, review it, to ensure that we're not missing anything or any information. So, I mean, that's the reason why I raised my hand a few times and, and put it back now because Daniel said the same identical thing and, and Joel said the same identical thing, but I just wanted to get some clarity because I was a little confused on hotline. Because typically a hotline, somebody's calling in asking for information. So how are you providing an article on a hotline? So thanks for that clarity, um, Erica. Um, I'm in agreement with that. First of all, defining what is going to be classified as an emergency. So no offense to the attorneys, but everything an, an attorney does is an emergency, right? And so you're going to have to be able to define what, what is actually going to classify as an emergency when you're, when you're putting these things together. And then have a subcommittee or a small group to be able to kind of look at the information and provide um, that information back over to the overall committee to make that determination. So that is my two cents. Thanks, Raquel, for putting us on the spot. Just one quick, just to interrupt, but one quick way to do it, and you guys have institutional knowledge of the types of things that people are frequently asking about on the ethics hotline, that would be a good place to start, right? Just in aggregate, what are people calling about, you know? Yeah. 
In terms of uh, my feedback, uh, Raquel, I, I don't think I have anything to add that hasn't already been brought up. Um, the one thing, uh, as Daniel just mentioned, about institutional knowledge, some of the comments about what opinions used to look like, I, those to me are the most important comments here because institutional wisdom for newer members of the committee is, I mean, it's just the one thing we really don't have. So I'd really like to uh, reach out to people who have been members before and say like, okay, well, how can we cut these opinions down? How, how can we get them out faster? But I, I don't really have anything to add that hasn't been broached already. Yeah, it, one thing I would add, I mean, no different than what, what others have added is that, you know, what the keto was talking about in an emergency, you know, in going back to Brandon's, you know, the initial case, I mean, that sounds like an emergency. I mean, is this, you know, guy, this person going to be executed, you know, in a day, in a week, in a month? I mean, I think it's impossible to get any type of feedback in that situation in a timely fashion, particularly if we have to, you know, as Vikita was talking about, maybe get a subcommittee together and then make a recommendation to the to the full committee. I mean, do we have to do we have to follow Bagley Keen in, in doing something like that? I mean, that it seems well, like that would be almost impossible to do yeah. uh, in in a timely fashion. That's uh, what. It, Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, that, that's really my biggest concern with, with that is how, yeah. how would we streamline the process like that and comply with Bagley Keen and everything else to get this information to the person or persons seeking some guidance. And, and Bill, is your is your question relating to the informal ethics opinion or a private letter uh, address I, type thing? Is uh, that, is that what you're... Yeah, generally, okay. I, I guess I'm just kind of yeah. a broad, a broad stroke there, really. Okay. Yeah, I think while well, they're both ideas, good ideas, the, the hotliner is not the same as some way of responding to a death row inmates issue. And we've got to keep that in mind. And as far as historically, uh, I served on COPRAC uh, for a term starting in the year 2000. And in those days, you know, we met in person. Bagley Keene didn't restrict us that way. We almost after every meeting would go out uh, for dinner that Friday night together and get a lot of business done. And we just don't have those opportunities now. And, and I know that a lot of um, a lot of the discussion that we have here was happened, you know, on, even on the way to the restroom or something during the course of the meetings as we were all there. And the subcommittee was able to work out these issues and somebody made a good idea. Someone would come back after lunch and say, yeah, we thought about it. Good. Put it in there. And there's not a lot of discussion uh, that we have now because if you get three people, you know, at the same bus stop, now it's a meeting or something covered by the Bagley Keen. And um, it's just that's part of what makes it so unwieldy. And if we could come up with a, uh, a solution to those issues and get us to be a little more coordinated and collegial and have those opportunities uh, without violating the law to kick around some of these ideas off record. Uh, Boy, that would sure help because that's why those opinions were quicker and and shorter. And also, we didn't do a lot of hypotheticals in those in that last term, you know, twenty three years ago. So that's the only perspective I've got. And then I think I'm just to add to what Joe was saying. I mean, what's the what's the process going to be if we put it if we deal with situations like the one that Brandon's talking about, right? You know, what's the turnaround time going to be? How quickly is the attorney needing that information? How quickly can we get that turned around so that it's beneficial and advantageous? So I think when we start looking at if we get to this point, classifying things that are going to be considered as an emergency, then we have to define what's that going to look like in the event like a death a a death row type of situation. Um, What's the turnaround going to be? What's the realistic turnaround going to be um, for a situation like that? And kind of put some of those processes into place. And it may not always fall within the time frame in which they need it. So, I mean, I think that's just kind of extra steps that we would have to take, you know, depending upon the severity of the classification of emergency. Uh, if I may, um, so I've realized, I've, I've reconsidered my, prior uh, uh, views as a primal scream without constructive uh, uh, proposals. I, I don't know how, you know, it, it just struck me that this, this particular death penalty issue, 
falling in the ethics confidentiality wheelhouse that's our expertise and it and it's not an issue that i that i'm aware of other authority on really struck me as like oh my goodness we we have to step up here we have to do so i don't know if i think it's probably unrealistic to think there, there's no clear answer in the world that uh, that we wouldn't be coming up with on our own this is a sort of thing that would take several committee meetings and i don't know that we can turn it around quickly I have a question about the um, the disciplinary arm of the bar, the OCTC. Do they ever tell somebody, give guidance in a situation like that? Because I'm speculating here, but if we're in a situation on this particular hypo where there's an attorney who has information um, that is relevant to a death penalty case, uh, that uh, and the attorney uh, wants to know if he or she can share that information with the court, can the OCTC talk about whether or not that's the kind of thing they would discipline an attorney for? That, that would really cut to the chase in, in this one instance. Um, not to speak for OCTC, because I, right. I don't think I, I think the answer is they do not do that. Oh. Um, but they won, um, yeah. Okay. I, I think that is the answer. That, that would essentially be like an advisory opinion. Would right, be? right. That, right. And creating like a safe harbor for that for that individual. And I think in the same way that the ethics hotline in a very different capacity doesn't advise, I think there are some concerns with, um, you know, uh, things that can get lost in translation to a certain extent. So if you yeah. if, if either one were to say, you know, this is OK, and then right. but you do something just slightly beyond or slightly different from what was said to be OK, I think that's where there could be some concerns. Uh, okay, Sarah, I'll come back and take my turn if that's okay. That'd be great. Okay, okay I'll take my hand down. Thanks, um, everyone, for sharing, and thanks, um, Sarah, for letting us know about Elizabeth's situation today. Um, lots of interesting things. I'll just share back my feedback, and I think Sarah was looking to wrap it up and say, okay, so now what? Um, and so I'll start there. I think what I understood Erica to say we were trying to do in this session is just get out ideas, brainstorm information. So we're not trying to close down or decide, yep, this is what we're going to do. Um, and so I feel like that's what we should do. Um, and so what that means, though, is that I think based on I think what I've heard Erica and Bridget say, the staff seem to have some ideas of what they would like to, how, how some things they could offer that they think would be effective um, for the goal of, you know, in public interest and based on the ebb and flow of how things are going. And so I do think if it's the next meeting or a future meeting, whenever this comes back on the agenda, I do think that having the staff present this is what we recommend this is what we this is the issue you know this is the this is what we're trying to address because i'm not sure that sort of we've all said different things but i'm not exactly sure if we said you know this is what we're trying to address and then these are the recommendations that staff have and that we then as a committee will be able to respond my sense is you you've heard a lot from us that will tell you in some way different things, but I, I, I feel like you gave us a problem, but you actually have an answer or some answers you want, and you were hoping we'd get to where you're going. And so I think, great, fine, we did that now though, but to really go where, where it's gonna be effective, why don't you just, you know, show us the teachers, the, the, the teachers uh, edition of what you're trying to do. Um, and I think, you know, we have enough trust and confidence in you guys and you and us that we'll, we'll give you the feedback that we think. Um, specifically for me, I think, oh, I think Daniel a long time ago, and the conversation talked about remote work and that's important, but it's not urgent. And I think the death penalty, and I think most of the things that come here, that's where they fall. And it's, it reminds me of Stephen Covey's his four quadrants of time. 
and you mostly should, that's where you should spend your time is important and urgent. And death penalty becomes urgent and important, and, but that should be the smallest amount of what comes here. So I don't think we should plan a process about urgent and important because that's not really for our work at all. And I do think though, the whole tech is now moving into urgent and important because we haven't addressed it. I think it's been, from the time I've been in the community, it's come up, but we don't do anything. And if I look back years, it's come up. So it's not like it's a new thing. And now all of a sudden it's become urgent because we haven't acted. And I think that we have to sort of acknowledge that. And so there's a lot of things that if I look at what we've been working on, it's interesting, but I don't think it fits particularly we're not as in tune with the direction of the field and it's that we really should be working on. We're kind of just in front of where we are um, kind of thing. So I think it's, it's, again, it's not necessarily the process, but it's almost a, re, a reframing of what should we really be working on as a committee? To me, that's what I see. Um, and so we didn't know about remote work, right? Two or three years ago. Uh, but we've known about it now for a while, and we're just now getting to it. And so that's more a function of us than anything else. Um, so I so I just offer that. I'm kind of the idea of loose guidance that seems interesting. Maybe the FAQs, not. I think we probably might get ourselves in a funny place with informal opinion. Um, from. As somebody, I think Erica said, we don't have the greatest of trust among attorneys and the public. So I think now you start doing informal things and people sort of interpret it certain ways. And then all of a sudden they, we lose some credibility and some trust. So I don't think we probably are in a, in a space of trust in the larger community that we can afford that at this point. But maybe the looser things about the guidance or the FAQs is still allows us to act, but it, it's um, more loose. It, it, it actually, based on what it says, you know, because you put in formal, but that's the very thing that people ignore. And it's like, oh, that was an opinion. You know, it's like people, is it, it's, it's a nuanced difference, but the people that had opinion on there and that's kind of what they drill in on. So. Um, so I say that also, I think this idea of using two people or three people of a committee and then saying, well, it's sort of commit co-prac, I think that puts co-prac as a body also in a funny place. Um, because not that our colleagues are going to say or do something different, but we're part of a whole. And so when things go out that only certain people were involved in, um, potential, I think for issues we probably don't need. Um, so just a range of things, but I think all of those, all of the things that people have said, I think are all worth thinking about. And, but I guess in summary for me, the highest order is what does staff think? Oh, I do think we should have some way that the committee can refer staff to take actions on things just as a matter of course that we don't even have to like vote on it or do something that there's some framework um, that things can go to staff. And that isn't part of rule six, it doesn't look like. Um, but I think the bigger issue is reframing what we're actually doing as a committee, what we're working on, um, which is really more, less things that are urgent, but more things that reflect what we need to be given guidance to as a community. And, and um, somebody had an excellent idea, which somewhere between Vakita and someone, like we're getting on the ethics committee. So they're giving us some framework about what's the landscape look like, but I'm not sure that's been filtering back to our committee or to even other committees. Uh, and that seems like a piece of feedback loop that we're missing over. Thank you guys for bringing that up. I, I thought it was uh, very helpful. Over. Thanks, Raquel. Um, Erica, 
I'd appreciate your feedback. I see your hands raised. Yeah, um, so I'll be brief. So I, I think what we, so to Raquel's point, yes, thank you. But we did wanna, you know, talk with the committee. We, we have, I mean, obviously staff has ideas, staff always has ideas, but I think that we don't wanna do anything that this committee is not comfortable doing. Um, you know, I could certainly think that we should be doing something. And, you know, if, if, if all of you do not think that's the appropriate thing, then I don't think that's what that we want the committee, the direction we want the committee to take. We don't want to just tell you this is how things are going to be. So that was what we were hoping to accomplish here. And I think we are frankly all on pretty much the same page on what we're trying to um, accomplish. What I would, um, the, as far as next steps, what I think um, staff would like to do is kind of take everything that's been said here and Raquel, to your point, come up with like an action plan as far as um, that we can present at our next meeting, which I think is June 23rd. As far as here's what we think um, we'd like to do. Does any of this actually require a change to the existing COPRAC rules? Or is it something that we can already do within the existing system? Like, you know, restarting doing some of the ethics hotline or articles. That's a great example of something we could already do. What I would like to get maybe some one last thing for input on is the comfort level with um, staff drafting of some kind. So it sounds from what I've heard, like um, COPRAC would be comfortable with, you know, staff taking the initial stab at um, like a hotliner type thing, uh, maybe doing the initial outlining of a formal opinion. So maybe not for today, but maybe at our June meeting, thinking about, you know, how far, it, maybe it's a case, on, case by case basis, but how far you want staff to take something meaning for a formal opinion, would you want staff to draft it, um, you know, have the working group be editing it and then have it just to, you know, expedite some of these more, ur you know, important and urgent to Raquel's point, um, formal opinions um, so that they can move forward a bit more, more quickly, just recognizing that again, that you guys are all volunteers already working very hard for this committee that meets pretty frequently um, just to move things along a bit more quickly if we can find some staff resources to do that. Thanks, Erica. And I, I do um, appreciate uh, your offer to prepare an, an action plan um, with kind of concrete proposals that we can consider at our next meeting. Um, one thing, though, I, I would, I'm hoping it won't be, and if maybe we could get, if there's anyone who, I, I'm happy to take a look at um, the action plan in advance of our next meeting, or if there's another member of COPRAC who wants to volunteer, um, I think that might be useful. But one thing, I, I don't want to necessarily limit it. I think there are a lot of great ideas here. And I, I know most people seem on board with the ethics um, alert, I'll, I'll say, instead of hotliner, because I think that gets confusing, that name. I actually like, but in any event, the ethics alert or article, um, I, I think that would be useful. But I, I do think, you know, Brandon started off this um, kind of agenda item with the discussion of the the very important opinion request we received. And, and I just don't think the ethics alert is a reasonable avenue for addressing that type of issue. So I, I'd like the action plan to come up with some a proposal to address that issue. Um, I, you know, and I, I know there's, I'm not, so in order to do that, I think we need to consider proposed amendments to COPRAC's current rules uh, that might allow something like a, a private, uh, response letter or perhaps a, an informal opinion with the appropriate disclaimers. So I, I think we should consider a proposal to address that type of opinion request um, beyond just the, the ethics hotline um, or a similar approach, which I, I think is great for addressing other, other types of issues. So. You know, I want to do since we were there were some questions about historical how things were done, and you know, I, it was my ongoing pet peeve with the reorganization and eliminating committees. You know, I would point out that you know before you had a fee arbitration committee that was handling advisories and issues dealing with fees that got eliminated. So now Coprac's taken on that chore as well. And then when they did that, they also downsized COPRAC from 16 to 12 members. So, you know, I, I think the combination of putting more things on COPRAC and fewer people to do it, um, you know, kind of adds to some of these issues in terms of, you know, the timeliness of opinions and the work that the committee does. Mm -hmm.
I don't have sorry, Ken, I don't have a particular response to that. That that comment. Well, I saw a head nod from Joel from uh, <laughs> Brandon and a smile from Joel, the two P guys. So <laughs> I wasn't expecting a response, but I just was I just was just throwing that out there because uh, there was questions about historically how things were done in process. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. Um, so I think given that it's 11:42 and we have one more agenda item before uh, we break for lunch. Um, I think we kind of have a plan for our, our next meeting. Is, is there anyone who, uh, I know um, it sounds like State Bar staff will take the lead in, in creating an action plan. Um, and I don't know if it would be appropriate to have maybe one or two COPRAC members volunteer to, once you prepare that draft, review it in advance of our next meeting. Would that, would that be useful? Erica, I guess I'll focus on you since you're probably the one who's going to take the lead on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think it'd be helpful to get um, some feedback on it um, from from in, so that you know we don't present something in June and you guys look at me like I'm you know <laughs> like what on earth is this? Um, so yeah, so that I mean I think that could either be you know coprac existing coprac leadership or um, you know whoever whoever wants to volunteer whatever uh, Sarah you decide makes the most sense for this. I, I think. Um, okay. I do certainly think that if there's like a working group or some kind, it would be helpful um, even just to have like a plan, a meeting, refinement, and that's it. It doesn't have to take up a lot of um, your time. Okay, that, that sounds great. I volunteer. We need we need a public member on that one, for sure. Thanks for, <laughs> for volunteering. And I'm happy to look at it as well. So, um, Thanks everyone. And I, I think I'm gonna move on to the next agenda item, just given timing. Um, and that's, um, I think on the new op opinion requests, which we, we kind of touched on briefly one of those, um, but if we could put up on the screen, um, and this is part of the agenda materials that everyone received. Um, and I think you're gonna have to zoom in for everyone. It's very tiny, at least on my screen. <laughs> Maybe just to the issue as opposed to everything else. And um, just considering um, what's maybe, the agenda? What's the agenda item you're on, Sarah? Um, I don't know the letter exactly. Uh, let me see. C two. So this is consideration of other new opinion and advisory topics. Okay, so you skip C one. You're skipping C1. There is no C1 that I have on my list unless I overlooked something, but I, I think this is the next item on the schedule that was circulated. So we're not getting everything on the full agenda that's posted. There should have, you, you might have Angela's email with the, the schedule for the meeting. So this is next on the schedule. Um, there aren't letters, I, I don't believe, on the scheduling item. But this is the, let me just pull that up. I don't have it open at the moment, but this is the next item on the schedule, Raquel. Sorry, I can't find it at the moment. Um, on the on the post agenda, I think we're on B2. Or I'm sorry, C2, excuse me. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was referencing. Raquel was just okay. asking why we're not doing C1. And I, I said, we're just doing the items that were on the this, this schedule. We don't have time to get to every item that's on the agenda that was posted on the website, I think. I think it's so. So all that was C one is artificial intelligence. So I think that that's maybe a combined right. conversation with the this. Oh, with this first opinion topic, correct? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we should also, as we're going through this list, which is about seven pages long, um, before we get to the items we previously decided not to opine on, we should also consider, which I think was an important point that that Mimi raise in terms of really um, trying to limit the new opinions we take on, given that we do have a, a pretty long backlog at the moment to the ones that we think are, are truly of broad interest and important. Um, so I, I'll i start with this first one, which um, as Erica just mentioned, overlaps with the uh, item on AI, um, which is, oh no, sorry. Maybe this is not the same one that I was thinking of what I was looking at earlier. I guess this first one, yeah, that's item four. 
Um, just to make it easier, maybe we'll start with this first one. Um, just, just go in the order since it's not too far before we get to the item four. So um, I, um, this first issue is, I'm sorry, it's hard to see for everyone, is, is the mechanism for allocating overhead charges in a written fee agreement if it's arbitrary um, and that it's not rationally related to the actual overhead incurred by attorneys is it unethical to include that in a fee agreement provided to the client um, prior to the representation? Um, I will uh, open this up for discussion, but my, my opinion is that the, we already have an existing arbitration advisory. I think that's fairly recent in 2021 that addresses um, many issues relating to fee disputes, including overhead expenses um, and has relevant authorities on this particular point. Um, so I, I don't think this would be a, an issue for which we'd, we'd want to um, That's opinion. That's and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to Ken or, or anyone from that who was working on that prior ethics opinion. Yeah, we did, we did the cost advisory uh, I want to say it was last year, 2021, that, that addresses that. And that cites, you're right, cites the ABA opinions and pretty much everything that deals with these issues. So I think there's already, you know, an, you know at least an, an arbitration advisory as opposed to an ethics opinion um, that, that deals with these issues. I guess the twist on this is, if it would otherwise be improper, is it somehow in unethical if you get the client to agree to it? <laughs> um, not quite sure how we would, you know, that, that would raise all sorts of issues regarding whether you could get informed consent to that and sort of thing. So I don't know that it's a route that we need to go down, but that's my two cents. I agree. Sorry, I, I didn't hear. So, someone just spoke and I, I missed it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Joel. I agree. Uh, we covered this in that advisory and the including of mechanism uh, in the fee agreement, I think is touched on in there, but that's also covered by other advisories which talk about the enforceability of a contract, et cetera. So, a uh, fee contract. So, I don't think this should take any time for us, especially in light of the last discussion. And I would just add, I mean, it sounds like, you know, what the request is getting at is, I mean, I don't know that we would want to opine on, you know, giving somebody, you know, potential advice on how they could go about um, charging for overhead uh, when, when, you know, it's not something that normally you can do uh, as, you know, addressed in the you know the AB opinion case authority and the advisory so and I, I briefly pulled that advisory too and I, I do think it kind of does talk about even when it's in the agreement it's supposed to reasonably reflect um the lawyer's actual costs so I, I do think it is, is pretty well addressed by the existing arbitration advisory so I, I would suggest um you might refer the requester to that arbitration advisory when we respond um, to this uh, request. But I'm gonna, I see Raquel, you have your hand raised. So did you have a comment on this opinion request? A uh, little bit broader. I have a question and, I, and then I have a comment overall. Uh, so Sarah, as a matter of process, is your thought for this agenda item, we're gonna go through each of these opinions? I don't think we have time to get through each each one. There's a seven page, but I, I think there are some that I wanted to make sure we just addressed on this first page. Um, because I, I think there are there's the one relating to AI that I want to make sure we get to. And then there's another um recent a couple of recent requests we received that appear to be a little bit more urgent that, that I'd like to get to today. Um, but I'm not thinking that we're gonna go through each and every one. Um that okay. we just don't have sufficient time to do so. Okay, and so if we didn't go by each one, how are you then thinking we'll dispose of this decision? I, I'm just, I, I don't have any uh, preconceived notion on what we should do. I just realized I wasn't, as we're starting, I wasn't sure what, what the plan was, especially you said 
we're going to do this before lunch. And I was like, oh, I don't, I wonder how we're going to get through all this. So I'm so, more just going to understand. How so just, just to, yeah, the schedule, the way it's, um, even, I think for some of the items after lunch, I've scheduled too much time for some of those items, okay. frankly, and I've heard back from, from others who are leading those discussions that they won't necessarily need that much time. Um, because unfortunately, as you we were talking about the backlog, many members weren't able to get their um, assignments in in time for this meeting. So our agenda items are fairly limited after lunch. So I'm confident that if we, even if we can't finish going over these new opinion requests, before lunch that we can continue it after lunch briefly before we get to the next agenda item. Okay, okay, so thank you. So ultimately we will, your ideas, we're gonna go through each item by item and make a decision. That's what I think I heard you say. Um, and so my comment is less about this particular one, although based on what I've heard, I can, I'll, I'll make the comment, which is, it sounds like the gentlemen who were working on this say it's already covered by something. And so I don't know, as a matter of process, do we automatically then reply back to the person who sent this and say, you know, this, uh, in reference to your question, please look at these advisories X, Y, and Z, and then that's sort of closed out. If we do, I see Erica shaking her head, that's great, because that's what I'd recommend. Um, but I think overall, my sense is two things at this point. One, we just had a dialogue that basically says we're going to decide how we're going to make these kind of decisions. So I feel like it's a bit premature to start disposing of this because we know we have, we're going to make some change, changes. And then secondly, just overall, I don't think we should assign any new actions until we close the ones we have open. I just think it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't seem um, effective to start assigning more things to work on when we haven't closed the ones we have already out. So not because of any particular subject or urgency or anything, unless we're gonna get rid of some we have open. So it's almost like, uh, when you buy, so you, when you commit to say something at home, like I'm not gonna buy another pair of shoes until I throw out, <laughs> right? So I'm not gonna keep bringing stuff on and keeping more and more things open. So that that's in, in some way more of a overall comment I'd have that I just wouldn't open anything new because we have too many things already open. As you just reinforce Sarah by saying, hey, agenda is gonna be light because we haven't had, a, people haven't had a chance to, progress what they were working on. And so I just don't see why we would open new ones over. Yeah. Also to, to Raquel's point, um, in past committees, uh, particularly the mandatory fee arbitration, we would always expect uh, staff to give an initial recommendation on what's been done on this, what are the resources recommendation for prioritizing and things like that? And, um, you know, the past experience is that A, if staff has the time, uh, that's a lot more helpful than kicking it around as a 12 member committee first and weeding, you know, weeding out the, the, the riffraff uh, uh, of the request. And uh, if we could get that, that might speed up these kind of considerations and also enlighten us on where this is, what, how it's been covered, what the history is too, each time a new year of committee members come on. So that's my thought. I think staff can at least start that process for the next June meeting. It may not be for all, however many are on this list, <laughs> but I think, that, I think that's well taken, Joel. Um, and certainly something we can work on. And just to clarify, because I don't know if I was entirely clear, Joel, about your comment, was it that, that staff would kind of try to narrow this list for us in advance, or was it that they might, the ones we decide to, that we are, that we want to opine on, um, that they would take the initial step of putting together maybe a, an issues outline? I just wasn't clear on your proposal, Joel. Oh, oh um, well, 
No, I don't think we ever uh, dealt with issues outlines in that setting. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was each time we get one of these requests, lists of things, we'd have it would come with a staff recommendation about what we should do with it. Okay. I'm you fine. Know, uh, it's been handled here. Uh, put it on for consideration here, refer it to uh, somewhere else or whatever. And, you know, and staff has been always over the years, and Erica is certainly no exception, of getting us guided in the right direction. And it sure would take a lot of chit chat of, among us off the calendar or off our, the time available to have that as our starting point. Understood. Yeah, I think that that would be helpful. Thanks, Joel. Um, so I'm going to propose that we move on to the next opinion because it sounds like we're inclined to to not opine on this particular request. Um, and this second request is one that I understand was recently received um, relating to, it's hard for me to read it now, but <laughs> whether a, a California lawyer um, can it assist, and I, I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> I need to be able to see it. I, I'll, I'll pull it up on my screen. Let's see. Whether California lawyers aid, can aid out-of-state pregnant individuals with seeking abortion care um, in or involving states that permit abortion access. And um, I think this is an important issue. Um, and I also um, think that this is one that we could consider the previous um, COPRAC ethics opinion um, concerning advising a marijuana business um, and potentially whether we could kind of maybe amend that opinion or update that opinion to address this situation and make it more broadly applicable. That's similar to how we decided previously to handle um, the amendment to propose rural professional conduct 8.3, um, which kind of raised a similar concern as this ethics opinion request. Um, so I would suggest as a, I think this is one worth considering, but I think there's a way to maybe um, have a more efficient outcome and, and timely if we consider a way to tie this into the pre-existing um, COPRAC opinion that I referenced. You know, this one strikes me, it seems like it's teeing up a, a different issue than we dealt with in that one, where it seems as, at least as phrase, if you're a lawyer in California and you have a client who's out of state in a state that doesn't permit abortion, can you aid that out of state client? I mean, it seems to me that raises all sorts of issues about, you know, jurisdiction practicing without a license in other states. And I'm not sure if that's what the requester actually wanted to get to or or is it more limited to you know if you know someone from a state that prohibits abortion wants to get an abortion in California can a lawyer assist that person I'm, I'm a little unclear exactly what they're asking on this one but yeah I, I agree um Ken it's not entirely clear but unfortunately I think um some of the issues you were, that you were question is whether they're raising perhaps unauthorized practice of law type issues in addition to some of the ethical issues we might have addressed previously in the other ethics opinion. However, I still think it is um, the state bar's policy that maybe that we wouldn't be able to issue an opinion on those unauthorized practice of law issues. Um, so I, I see, Joel, you have your hand raised. Did you want to yeah. wait? Sarah, that was my issue. I mean, you just have to look at what's going on between Washington and Utah right now. And uh, it's multi-jurisdictional practice questions and we're prohibited from looking at unauthorized practice. So while it's a very important issue that ought to be looked at, I'm not sure we have the muscles to flex to look at it. Yeah, and I, I do think for that, but I think there are many other ethical issues raised by this question be up that we could opine on beyond the unauthorized practice of law, some of which I think are contained within that other ethics opinion. Um, but Erica, did you wanna weigh in perhaps on the state bar policy issue or something else? Yeah, I just wanted to say that as we're looking, relating to the last item, um, 
and I should have raised it earlier, I apologize, but um, as we're looking at changes to, to perhaps other alternatives to how COPRA can, can provide advice, be it you know ethics alerts and otherwise, I think, I know we talked about it, uh, probably I think it was about a year ago, it was right when I first um, started staffing COPRA, but um, looking at the UPL, whether or not we want to, um, whether COPRA wants to request that that restriction on UPL is um, removed, particularly if we are going to be um, looking at AI and other topics a bit more, um, where certainly um, unauthorized practice of law um, by a perhaps a, a non-human <laughs> or the the humans that that are um, you know uh, that that own the program um, in some capacity. I think that's something we may want to revisit as well. And certainly staff could come with a um, recommendation for that as well at the June meeting if that was something Coprac was interested in. I. Yes, uh, so before getting into that, that issue that you raised, I just had a, a quick question about, um, I assume that restriction wouldn't prohibit us from, and I'm not saying we should do it with this opinion request necessarily, but perhaps AI or something else, but wouldn't prohibit us from issuing, uh, talking about UPL issues in an ethics alert, maybe? Would we, still, would we be able to address UPL issues in an ethics alert? Um, yeah, so I think I think it's a, you know, they are addressed. So let's so, you know, for example, the remote work opinion, you know, it's flagged issues of UPL versus this is or is not UPL. And I think they're, you know, I know it's splitting hairs, but I think that's kind of the line that COPRAC has taken in the past in the sense of like, you know, you need to be concerned about UPL. Um, so again, this is maybe uh, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here. But if we're talking about doing like an ethics alert, that's more of an issue spotting type thing. Certainly, I think that you know, saying there could be concerns surrounding UPL, I don't think there's anything that would prohibit COPRAC from doing that in that format. The inverse, you know, the, or the other side of it being, you know, saying that you know, going into Texas and assisting somebody in circumventing, um, you know, getting reproductive care or something like that. I think if we're saying that is or is not the unauthorized practice of law, I think that's a different question. And again, I, I realize that it is a bit of splitting hairs on that. I understand what you're saying. And just based on that response too, I think it might be helpful for our next, um, for the action plan uh, that we talked about previously for that to address kind of the parameters of the ethics alert, um, you know, whether it's limited to issue spotting or can contain more of an analysis would be useful. Um, but I feel like I saw some other hands raised. Now I don't see any, but I'll just open it up for discussion, this, this topic um, on this ethics opinion request. I, I think the topic, I think there are important fruitful topics in there. It's it's obviously too vague at this point, but I, I think it's worth looking into and seeing if there are ethical issues we can appropriately address and provide guidance on. Okay, great. And so I, I see that it's after um, noon. Um, so I did want to break very soon for lunch, but um, just to kind of give a, get a general sense from um, the committee members. Um, is there anyone who's um, opposed to exploring this uh, issue in an ethics opinion uh, in response to this request? Okay. I, 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 I with her hand raised. Yeah. yeah. And again, for the reason, like we we can't, we're not managing what we already have. I just don't, it's important, but I just don't, yeah, I, I think it's, I don't want to use irresponsible, but it's some word over there. Like we're just taking on something that we just can't do. A good, we're not doing a good job on what we have. And I, so I just don't think we should do this at this point. So, okay. yeah, I understand that point that you raised earlier, Raquel. I, I think um, for now we should just, I think with all going over this list, I think at the end, I kind of want to get a general sense for how many or fall into the category if you want to explore further considering an ethics opinion. And then we can kind of make an action plan based on that, um, based on the number that we decide we might want to pursue further. Uh, we don't have to get into the details of timing at this particular stage, but I do want to get a general sense. And it might be a situation where I think this was right, raised by Mimi or others in terms of just prioritizing our, our existing opinions. Because I think there are some that aren't in the past the issue stage outline where you might decline to opine on them, even if they, there's currently working subcommittees. 
So I think we need to kind of prioritize everything as well. And because some, some issues might be more urgent than others. Um, but for so, now- so I, so I do have a question and I guess um, without saying it, you're not persuaded chair um, without you saying it. But I get what, what I feel like I'm probably disconnecting on is what is the urgency to make a disposition of these items? Urgency meaning like, why, why are we trying to do this today? Not because it's not because we don't have time. We have plenty of time, but just given where we are, why why are you feeling the need to push keep pushing us forward? To consider adding opening over. I think some topics, you know, really are worth a, a timely opinion, and if you wait too long, um, it will no longer be quite as relevant um, or as important as important and some. And there's also, I'm not saying, I know we have a lot of existing opinions, uh, draft ethics opinions, some are in further stages than others, but I know based on, you know, just what's on the agenda, that there are some that just, you know, the subgroup might decline. Once you get to the issues outline, that's the initial step, then we might decline. Okay, based on the issues outline, we feel it's not something we wanna move further on. So there's some agenda items that we might not go further on. That's all I'm saying. So I think we still need to consider new opinions because everything that's in progress is not necessarily gonna result in a final ethics opinion. Um, so I'm seeing the time is now 12.08. So I propose that we take a break briefly for lunch and return at um, just for, so it's around 1, 110. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. you there. Should should we log off or just freeze ourselves? Which would a state bar prefer? It's it's, up, it's up to you. Just if you if we're going to stay on, uh, do mute yourself and probably go off camera. <laughs> okay. Thanks. And so I, um, Angela, I don't know if you're on or, or Mimi, if you could share that, um, the screen with the new opinion topics. Kind of wanted to streamline the discussion by, by focusing on one or two more. Yeah, uh, Sarah, this is Joel. Uh, before we do, there's some, I'm not pictured on there, but i just like to say something about the last one of these topics we discussed, a comment sure. on that's okay. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, when I mentioned something about the collegiality of past committees, I wasn't meaning to say that this committee is any less collegial. I was just trying to point out there were so many more opportunities to for us to express our collegiality and enthusiasm than sitting here watching these postage stamps of each little face that I see. So that's all I wanted to say. Sarah, you're on mute. Sorry, thanks, Joel. I wasn't concerned with your, your comment. I actually, you know, I, even though we haven't had as many in-person meetings since I joined the committee, um, I think I've, I've only participated in a few, but I, I do think you get more of that from the, the in-person meetings, like you're saying. So I, um, I think there, if there's a way to maybe include that in the, the action plan items, um, if there's a way we could kind of, I know the second, we were supposed to have another in-person meeting. I understand there are some state bar budgetary issues which prohibit us from having those in person, but I know in the past we've tried to do some informal um, gatherings for folks who are in San Francisco or in the LA area where we could still maybe notice a meeting at a particular location. Um, and so I just think that's, that's a good way to try to get us together. But, um, Moving on to this next, uh, to some of the opinions, I wanted to talk about the fourth opinion request. Um, yeah, which is what are security risks of current AI technologies and guidelines for AI developers 
be created to safeguard confidential information. So I think the way this is this request is worded um, kind of raises some technical issues that um, I personally don't feel <laughs> um, COPRAC would be suited to opine on, but I, but I still think there are we sh the, just the issue of AI generally and some of the ethical issues associated with AI is something that COPRAC should consider exploring. And I, I would like to open that up for discussion and also if, whether it should be through a, a potentially through a formal for ethics opinion or is this something that others feel might be more suitable for an ethics alert. Um, so I, I just want to pause and open that up for discussion now. I, you know, I, I think it's a hot topic, but you know, it's it's changing so rapidly. It's probably something that's better for like a ethics alert and you know, the kind of flags issues and that sort of thing. That's just my thoughts on it. <clears throat> yeah, I, if I can just offer my similar thoughts, there's an ethics opinion from a few years ago from Coprac about a duty to be competent with technology generally. And I don't really know how much more specific we can get here. Um, number one, I don't know that any of us are competent to really talk about the risks of AI. And number two, they change so quickly. So unless we want to approach like a, a really specific, interesting, weird angle, like, you know, is it okay to let the AI uh, write all your briefs or something like that? Um, the risks posed by AI, like in deceiving you or um, attacking your trust account or piercing your privileged communications or something. I'm not sure what we could offer. That's just my two cents. Which is not to say that I'm not deeply alarmed about it all. Anyone else? Uh, Sarah, so the specific request, I think, is narrow. And so I, I do think we should consider a broader one for which this could be answered. And um, I believe that we, in our, maybe it was October meeting, when in the fall, we had the strategic plan presented to us and we've not come back as a committee to talk about it, but AI and a number of things in that, what I call tech and law is part of it. And I do think it fits inside of that. And I think, and so crypto is also part of that, even though we had it going forward. Um, so that's my take. I don't think we are subject matter experts on it. So I do believe in order to, um, write any opinion or guidance or anything, we do need to be, you know, engaging with people who are more knowledgeable. Um, and my sense is we should be doing that. Otherwise it's gonna become urgent because we're gonna be behind the curve. So we should, we, we, it, it's I think time for us to get, start getting more informed about the whole area and the implications and not only on the risk side, but also, you know, there are some benefits that if people understand how to use it um, and in the framework of, of uh, the law could be helpful. And we could also include that. So there's the, you know, there's the, the part that people are afraid of, but there is also ways uh, in, in the practice of law that it could be quite helpful. Um, this is my thought. And I, I, I was I'm reminded of Hunter's pa uh, panel. And the idea, you know, some of the stuff that, that they talked about they were doing with the implicit bias and different things and some of the, you know, some of the implications of, of how technology and bias are going to intersect um, more than we think. And we should be thinking about that, too. How, so how does all that fit together? That's my take. So, yeah, on, on AI on this one, but in a much broader context, I think it's too narrow. Over. Thanks, Raquel. And I, yeah, I agree with a lot of those thoughts. Um, Erica, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I was just going to say, so, you know, again, tied back to our earlier conversation about 
different ways to approach things. So I think um, a benefit of a you know ethics alert and and this is a ever evolving and and um, very different subject area than maybe what, what has been done before, where this really does require a lot of um, perhaps outside knowledge that some of the people here, myself included, aren't totally you know comfortable with yet and don't know enough about where they may feel qualified to be opining on some of these things. So to that extent, I mean, I think we can we can also talk about bringing in people who you know have have more expertise in these areas, and, and if it's an ethics alert as opposed to a co-prac opinion, you know, a co-draft or something like that, where it's written by um, a co-prac member as well as maybe somebody else who wants to attach themselves to it and stuff like that. So being a little bit more um, creative in that, I think, is something that that could be useful for this topic. Yes, Erica, I actually had a similar thought. Because um, in the past, um, with some local bar associations I've been involved in, we've kind of, um, not necessarily with alerts, but with um, some CLEs, we've done joint CLEs to bring in expertise from two different committees. So um, if there is um, maybe a CLA committee on um, technology or, or something, or others with, with expertise more on the technology side, I, I think that would be a great idea and do a joint alert. Um, so it sounds like um, from what I'm hearing from most people that they're in favor of considering this topic more broadly than, than on, the, on the screen now, but for an ethics alert um, and perhaps doing it jointly with, with others with more expertise on AI itself on the technology side. Any other feedback or suggestions? And I don't know that we can address this too much now, but I, I just wanted to, and we might have already addressed this to some extent, um, but I just wanted to flag the next um, new opinion request, which we already went over, um, which is the one that Brandon raised, which is the fifth item on the screen um, involving disclosing confidential information um, from a deceased client. And although um, we understand the current, under the current rules, COPAC rules, we, we wouldn't be able to um, issue an opinion on the, this topic. I know there was some discussion perhaps about kind of changing the facts, not directly tying it to the, this particular issue. And if there's a way we could still address the topic. Um, I'm, I'm not clear on how we could do that exactly. And, and Brandon, I think you were the one who raised this um, among leadership when we first got this particular request. So I, I just wanted to um, give you an opportunity to speak to this if, if you have any suggestions and then open it up to others. No, that was my painful admission when we were talking about it earlier was that yeah. um, I just don't think we are a nimble enough. There's no um, easy answer to this question that we can all just talk about right now and agree to. There yeah. might be outcomes we can agree on, but the ethical analysis is not simple. I don't think it exists. I think this is a super important issue that will that would take us a great deal of effort. It may be worthy of that effort, but it's not going to happen in time to satisfy the people that are asking. So, you know, we had talked about like a really informal response, like telling them, hey, COPRAC has certain rules and procedures that that don't allow us to respond as timely as we would like to. But, you know, CLA doesn't have that. These other ethics committees might be of more use. I don't know. I don't know if we can do that. Yeah, and I know I, I know we could talk about that more later too, but I also think referring them to some just relevant authorities to consider without directly providing. Yeah. Uh, advice was another issue we, we talked about. So I think that might be the easiest way to address this issue for now, um, given the, the limitation under the current rules and then the action plan can kind of discuss going forward um, if, if there's a way we can address these types of opinion requests in the future. Um, so there's there, a, okay, sorry. Yeah, is there any other uh... Uh, state bar resource or section or anything else that's doing work on AI in terms of the whole technical thing as it applies to lawyers that we could resource or we could check in with and bring ourselves up to speed on some of those issues? 
What about Atils? Is that one that addressed AI at all or no? Um, I, I can jump in here. So Adels did. Um, Adels um, is is no longer. Um, they were mostly exploring um, like regulatory sandboxes to um, mm -hmm. to promote um, access and innovation. Um, so um, a different office in the state, where the Office of um, Access and Inclusion is looking into AI from like a access perspective, and then the Office of Professional Competence is looking into it from um, another perspective. And I, I'm sure other offices within the state bar are as well. But I think. Joel, to, to your question more directly, I think that is the, the purview of, of the Office of Professional Competence and then also, you know, with COPRAC looking at it as well. Is it possible to set up some method of coordinating uh, or exploring coordination throughout uh, as to what are all the issues and bring them all together and then we can make a decision about what COPRAC's <clears throat> role in that overall issue might be, if any. Yeah, staff, staff is already doing that. So we we have some internally, we have some staff related meetings exploring the, this topic and kind of uh, looking at it from, from our different uh, offices perspectives and, and the ways that it is applicable to our particular office. Thanks. So as a follow up to the exchange between Joel and Erica, so Erica, can you facilitate what Joel is suggesting in terms of for the committee's knowledge? How, yes. how so I so how yeah so I guess tell us more about how what your guys are doing collaboratively can help what we're talking about needing to do in terms of just our own knowledge. Sure. So what's happening right now, at least um so from my perspective, is there's just a lot of information gathering right now. And it's, it's kind of a, an assessment of what we know and what we don't know to a certain extent. Um, and then, um, you know, looking at the these individual tools that are being created, um, you know, in the private sector, there's there's many of them, right, that are that are coming up that are directly applicable to the practice of law. I mean, everyone knows there's ChatGPT and ChatGPT4, but that's, I mean, those are applicable for everyone. There are ones that are um, either in existence and being um, demoed or frankly used by, by law firms currently. Um, and so looking at, at those models, um, how law firms are using them currently, how law firms are exploring using them, that's certainly something that our office is looking at. Um, on the other side, you know, from, I don't want to speak for Office of Access Inclusion, but they're looking at how, you know, how these tools can benefit and, and promote access um, to, for, for the general public who, who have um, legal issues or don't have legal issues and just to identify those and as far as and many other ways of looking at it from that perspective. I think what we're looking at is, um, so internally the, the state bar different departments are looking at these things, information sharing, and then kind of trying to figure out how to allocate some of this research and, and information um, uh, and, and outreach, excuse me, um, to the different um, stakeholders that the state bar has. So from a office of professional competence perspective, that's to licensees to make sure that they're complying with the applicable rules of professional conduct when they're using some of these tools, right? For Office of Access and Inclusion, it's a very different perspective. But I think what we would be looking at is if, if this is something that COPRAC wants to pursue, pursue is, um, you know, there are, like I said, there's, there's some knowns and there's many unknowns. And so bringing in some people that could perhaps help with those unknowns so that we're not asking this committee or OPC staff or anyone to, to advise on something where we're really, truly, it's not, um, we're not the experts of that. Thanks, Erica. And just um, to clarify, so in terms of if we're collaborating with others on potentially an ethics alert on the, this topic, um, would we be collaborating with others within the state bar or could we explore outside resources and committees? Yeah, I think I think that, you know, as we've been talking this morning, I think that we can, there's many things we could do. So okay. I think we could certainly, you know, partner with other state bar staff. There's no, um, at least at this time, there's no like AI specific um, committee or ad hoc committee or working group task force, whatever you want to call it on this topic that's been appointed by like the board of trustees or anything like that. Um, so there's not a, a formal body of the state bar that's that's exploring these things right now. So far, at least to my knowledge, it's, it's um, staff driven. Okay, great. Um, so on that note too, in addition, I, I know um, there's some work going on within the state bar, but if anyone on this committee um, has any 
contacts or, or, or knowledge based on their work on other committees um, of some, someone or, or a committee that might be useful in providing guidance or just to think about that for our next meeting, that, that would be helpful. Um, and Ken, I know you had some great panelists as well at the ethics symposium on this topic. So I don't know if any of them would be able to make suggestions um, that that might be useful too. I can um, reach out to them when I get my, when I contact them about the feedback on the symposium. Sounds great. Um, so I on know this, on this criminal one here that we still up on the screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes it different. I was looking at the materials at the back of this uh, item C2. This particular one wasn't a random request. This was <clears throat> an order from a court directing habeas counsel to contact the state bar to obtain a, see about obtaining a formal ethics opinion. I don't know if that changes the thought process about you know trying to refer to someone else. No, I mean, yeah, that, that's yeah, we were aware of that. And I think that's the one issue that why I think Brandon initially rate was, was very concerned that we it's something we unfortunately the way our current rules are, I don't think it's something we can do more on um because it involves a, a matter that's subject to pending litigation. Um, so our thought was since, yeah, I, I think we're, we're, uh, yeah, I, I can't think of how that really changes the, what we can do currently under the, under the rules. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, I we obviously can't opine on this particular case, yeah. maybe, you know, whether it was an issue of, you know, you know, more general ethics considerations regarding the duty of confidentiality and, you know, that kind of a circumstance. And... Yeah. So that was helpful what you just said, Sarah, um, which is the, it, it's really because it's a matter of on litigation, not because of our inability to be responsive in a timely way. So I realized when we were talking earlier, it was more about our nimbleness. But even if we were nimble, it sounds like because it violates number, I lost the paper now, but one of those numbers, we couldn't do it anyway. And yeah, I, I, more, yeah, that, right? that's that, right. That, that's right. Those are the concerns you're talking about previously. It's 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 not just a matter of the you know our ability to timely respond. I th I think we could we could do that if if necessary. I think there's a way to do that. I, I think it's more the issue of the two, the, the co rule. Yeah, the number two rule which says uh, can't do it if it's uh, re regarding investigation or litigation. So that that's what makes it an, an, a non-starter. Even if it was told to us by our court because of our own rule, we we are more obligated to our rule than the court direction. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. that is my understanding. Um, that yeah. Okay, thank you. So that was helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I know that there are bunch of other um, opinion requests. And rather than going through um, more at this time, just given that I, I want to move on to other agenda items, I wanted to just pause and see if anyone has had a chance to look at those new opinion requests and, and um, wants to suggest one for further discussion purposes that they, they feel we should consider um, further at this time. And if not, I think we can address the topic of new opinion requests at a, at a later time. I, I I looked at number three. I mean, I don't know. That, I don't think we should do that. That's a fee arbitration specific question, mm -hmm. and it touches on an issue that the fee arbitration committee had well had had addressed in the past because most of the rules in fee arbitration provide you know you get four hours for free and after four hours, you know, they can charge 
like 150 bucks per arbitrator. And I know with the committee, there was some question where that came from, the ability to charge and whether that was in excess of the filing fee. And we had general counsel's office look at that at one point. Uh, and this is an issue that pops up occasionally. I dealt with it a few times and probably Joel did too as presiding arbitrator, you know, when, you know, when the arbitrators want to get paid, but only one side is willing to pay it, you know, can the other side pay it? And does that create bias amongst the arbitrators? So I, I, I only raise that because I don't think that's something, you know, that the committee here should probably opine on. It's something that's really dealt with at the administrative level, uh, you know, with the, you know, presiding arbitrator and used to be at committee level, but we don't have a committee anymore, so. Yeah, Ken, I, I have a vague recollection. This might've been one of the items that we were still kicking around <clears throat> when our agenda ended. And it definitely is, it, it was, very little an ethical issue. It was more a procedural, did it comply with the statute, et cetera, issue. Yeah, I know I raised it because I mean, we're not, since to, to the extent that COPRAC has taken over some of the FIAR you know, uh, issues and doing advisories, and as, we're not on those, I don't think we're limited to ethics. We're limited, you know, we, those are going to be addressing fee and fee arbitration specific issues, kind of like the advisories do. I think that's our role, but I could be wrong. Um, I, maybe Erica could confirm. Um, my understanding is consistent with yours, Ken's, but I, I'm not certain. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. But if this is, if I'm hearing Ken right, this is more of a is this a procedural question as opposed to a? Yeah, I mean, the when the when there were two issues that the committee looked at, you know, you know, because because I think the last time it popped up when we were reviewing a request for a county bar to. Uh, uh, update their rules, one of them wanted to increase that fee from 150 to 175 an hour per arbitrator. And that generated a lot of internal committee discussion on what the authority was for charging, you know, for the volunteer arbitrators to charge an hourly fee after four hours, where that came from. And I don't know that we, I don't know that we actually ever got to the point where we got an answer to that. And I know they were there were some consultations with general counsel's office, uh, whether that type of because the statute says you can charge a filing fee. And the question was, is this fall within the statutory authorization for a filing fee? And you know, at the time the committee was disbanded, I don't think we ever got around a, an answering or, or, or finishing that issue. Yeah. The, the yeah. specific question here about, you know, can one, when one side doesn't want to pay, can the other side pay, raise a whole bunch of issues, whether if the arbitrators are only getting paid by one side now, is that going to make some, for some, you know, potential bias and those sorts of issues. Those were the procedural questions that have popped up. I know a couple of times, I think I had to deal with that as presiding arbitrator. Yeah, a lot of the uh, private arbitration associations and, uh, you know, retired judge providers, um, they do have a rule which provides that if the side, if it, unless otherwise by contract, if it calls for a split and one party can't do it, that the other party can pay the share and recover it back in the award or whatever. But the issue was that we were dealing with was whether all that would comply with the statutory authority and the underlying purpose of a cheap and speedy uh, mandatory fee arbitration. So uh, I, 
again, I don't think it's an ethics issue. And I don't think that, um, certainly I don't want to get into a, try to do a, uh, uh, an advisory on that point, particularly since uh, with apologies to Rockdale, I've, I've still got a couple here sitting on my desk. Yeah, if anything where that would, would come into play, you know, is, you know, when the committee was in existence, there were two kinds of advisories. There were the arbitration advisories that got, you know, put onto the website and are publicly available. And then they all, we also did program advisories. And those are the ones that really dealt with you know, these kinds of specific procedural questions, you know, those were not a matter of public record. Um, it was just, you know, advice to the programs, how to deal with specific procedural issues, kind of along the lines of this issue, this question. Now, I don't know whether, you know, we, we've done arbitration advisories and under the new system unlike when we had the committee those go out for public comment and all of that i don't know whether the the, the concept of these program advisories has survived the elimination of the committee or not yeah you know may i suggest before we spend any more time here in this committee meeting that maybe erica or somebody at staff would talk to Elizabeth Liu and see where they are on this thing and see if it's even a problem. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I mean, I think this, I, I don't think this is necessarily within the, I'm looking at COPRAC's uh, directive as it relates to um, the consolidation, if you will, of uh, the fee arbitration opinions. And I don't think this question falls within the purview of that, first of all. And second of all, this may just be something talking about your, uh, the program advisories, Ken, that, that at this point, the mandatory fee arbitration program staff could could better address as opposed to this committee. So I can I can we could if the committee wants to decline on this one, um, and we could direct that staff will be looking into this and, and reach out to the requester instead. That makes sense to me. Oops. So I was going to move on to the next item on the agenda, um, which seeing if he's, oh yeah, there you are, Brandon, that Brandon will lead the discussion on, which is uh, conversion clauses in contingency fee contracts. Yes, I will try to, I, I don't think this has to be a really long discussion because I've kind of raised this issue a couple of times. We, get, we got a lot of public comment on the conversion clause opinion. Almost none of it focusing on our opinion as to the impropriety of conversion clauses triggered off of a, a client's um, decision to settle a case or to not follow an attorney's uh, recommendation or instruction to settle a case. Does, that doesn't seem very controversial at all. What's much more controversial is these conversion clauses and contingency fee arrangements where um, if the attorney-client relationship is severed, terminated by the client, or sometimes even by the attorney, but by the client generally, the attorney then is entitled to some sort of non-contingent fee, right? Um, under the law, under most circumstances, unless the attorney has abandoned or done you know, something wrong, um, the attorney is going to get quantum merit fee. Attorney number one and attorney number two um, uh share the contingent recovery that was agreed to. So, so you know, we're operating from this baseline where um, terminated attorneys in appropriate circumstances, the law already protects their entitlement to some reasonable value of their fee. Um, our opinion strongly suggested, but did not outright, our, our draft opinion, uh, strongly suggested, but did not fully shut the door on the, the idea that these sorts of um, uh, guaranteed or non-contingent or hourly conversion clauses in a contingent fee arrangement, um, if they exceed quantum merit, which is already provided for, um, are in ethically improper, right? And we got criticism, really well-considered criticism from both directions. 
there's a whole body of lawyers who say, we need these conversions clause to protect us against unethical clients, sneaky clients. We in the civil rights or employment law area can invest a huge amount of time in a case, and we're only going to get a statutory fee award. Um, but let's say the client wants to drop the case uh, and just take his or her job back, right? And then deprive us of a fee or things like that. Um, personally, and, and I and I we've talked about this on the drafting group, uh, Ken and, and Joel and I. We are not persuaded by this. You know, even those consumer lawyers that make this argument say um, it's an access to justice issue. These clients can't afford our fees, so they need contingent lawyers. And in order to incentivize contingent lawyers to take these sorts of cases, they need this sort of protection of conversion clauses. And we generally, and I, I'll let Ken and Joel speak as well, because I don't want to misstate their views. I find that. Um, actually concedes the reason why it's ethically impermissible. When you say these folks can't afford hourly fees, and that's why they need contingent agreements, those, those contingent agreements shouldn't convert into hourly fee agreements if they exercise their absolute right to terminate their attorney. I'm not pretending it's not an issue, and I'm not pretending it doesn't have some of the consequences that they're talking about. I just think from an ethical point of view, I'm fully unpersuaded by that angle. A couple commentators, and notably um, the LA County Bar Association Ethics Committee, said, hey, it looks like you guys really uh, are um, coming out strongly against these conversion clauses in, in the circumstances I outlined, but you don't quite shut the door. and We don't understand why. If it's improper, it's improper. Why are you doing a couple um, hypothetical scenarios where you're just really coming up with some unusual and unlikely facts to bend over backwards to show some daylight as to why this could happen. I found myself thinking about that, that approach a lot. And, and I, I've talked about it with Ken and Joel, and it is my point of view that we should actually go all the way. That when you look at a couple of the cases we cited in the contingency, in the conversion clause um, opinion draft, um, it's the uh, Fracassi versus Brent case. That's the case from 1972, which says, um, you know, a, a terminated contingency fee attorney can't demand his entire fee on top of what the next attorney gets. You get the quantum marrow. You get the reasonable value of your fee for what you did towards the recovery versus what the second attorney did towards the recovery. And, and, and you'll get paid, but you can't insist on the whole thing. And you can't do it until the contingency occurs. Between that case and this Scapa Brown disciplinary case, which I went back and studied again, and there these attorneys were disciplined. They had a minimum fee in their fee agreements. It's a, it's a contingency fee agreement, but if you fire the lawyer, they get a minimum automatic three hours, 600 bucks, automatic no matter whether they've done any work or not, right? And... Now, those attorneys did a whole slew of terrible things that they were disciplined for. And this was just one of them and probably the least uh, uh, vivid. But the uh, state bar court said, look, you they knew the Fricasse versus Brandt law. You know, you don't, you're a contingency lawyer, you don't get paid until there's a contingency, and you don't get paid except the reasonable value of your services if you're terminated. And that by insisting on this fee, they were insisting on an unconscionable fee. And reading that, it suggests to me at least that um, that you really can't do this. If you if you sign up a client on a contingency fee agreement, even if you get them to contract for this sort of conversion clause penalty, that's unethical. That is a disciplinable offense. And so my view is, you know, we need to, revisit our opinion and figure out our approach. My suggested approach is that we do close the door, that we do, we can remove our hypotheticals, we can make this a shorter and more um, succinct opinion. And I think it's a public service personally, and now those are just my values, but I think it's a great public service. And I think we should also um, lean into the part of the Scapa Brown decision, which says that, you know, really even whether you you can't contract around these principles and putting it in your fee agreement is seeking to collect an unconscionable fee. I can see all sorts of objections 
right? I could see a lot of people um, not calling their fee agreements fee, uh, contingency anymore and trying to you know, mess about with the language of how you describe the fee and still trying to do this. But I think we, I would suggest that we consider going this further client protective step, knowing it's going to get a lot of pushback from areas of the bar. Um, but before we put in a huge amount of work on this drafting approach, I thought it would be important to just sort of take people's temperature on this. Is this a road we want to go down or not? Yeah, uh, Brandon, as you know, I, I don't think it's an access to justice issue because I think I commented in one of our meetings, I can't get halfway to Los Angeles without seeing 200 billboards, which give them access to the motorcycle attorney and to the brothers and to this and that. It's there. What also, though, justifies uh, not allow or shutting the door, as you put it, is that the whole contingent fee is based upon the risk. And when you hedge the risk and still charge the same contingent fee, that's un that gets you right to unconscionable, which is what the Scapa and Brown case said. And so um, I'm perfectly willing and happy and hope we do shut the door. I agree. I mean, I'm. We, we talked about this in the subcommittee, and I, you know, in one of the uh, public comments, we dealt with that uh, hypothetical number five, which where we really were kind of straining to come up with something. And I, I've always thought we should have take that one out because it was so far fetched, and it really kind of, you know, contrary to what the rest of them are. You know, and on the access to justice issues. I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic, but there are ways that, you know, people can do that, you know, you know, hybrid agreements. I've seen a lot of those where there's, you know, a fairly minimal, you know, or much lesser hourly fee that, you know, isn't particularly onerous at some points uh, with the lower contingent fee. So, I mean, there are other options out there. Um, I think I mentioned this in our internal. I just recently saw a, a a version somewhat similar to the things we talked about there, where uh, you know the fee agreement it had something similar. It, you know, it was the greater of reasonable value, or and then it had an hourly rate. Right. So it was kind of setting a. It was kind of setting a floor, I guess, is how I interpret it. Uh, if you know that you know, but the problem I have with that is, you know, the, the reasonable value is the reasonable value, <laughs> and you know, if the reasonable value is you know less than what you state the, you know, the hourly rate is, then that gets you back into the situation which Joel was just discussing, where you're you're hedging your bet and the, the contingent factor is largely being, uh, re, you know, at least reduced to some extent, so. Yeah, and the one more problem with it is that if you load into a contingent fee contract of the first lawyer and that lawyer is performing unsatisfactorily, the client makes the decision, I better go get someone else. Now they do that with this obligation that's gonna come out of the fee that the next lawyer is gonna be getting that mm -hmm. otherwise wouldn't have, have been there in addition to quantum merit. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, it impacts upon your right, your unfettered right to fire your attorney and go somewhere else. I, I think it's really interesting that, you know, Joel and Ken and I have, you know, we have a we have a perspective on this. We deal with fee disputes all the time. One of the repeated public comments we got is these are anti-contingency lawyers looking for a problem that doesn't exist. And I'm, you know, I'm a contingency fee lawyer. And and in my practice, this is a I'm not, I don't know percentages of what lawyers do this or not, but I have had a lot of clients who have been afraid to, to fire a lawyer because of this clause or fired a lawyer and then were just crushed in a case with some sort of claim 
for immediate hourly fees that, you know, wrecks the case, makes it impossible to find other accounts, all sorts of things like that. So, you know, I do see it as a real problem. Um, I have no uh, statistical idea of how widespread it is, but I see it a lot. And I also see it as deeply unfair and, and anti-client, pro-lawyer, a lawyer viewing cases as commodities, a lawyer viewing clients as commodity, all these things that I've that I think it's in our uh, wheelhouse to try to protect against. But there will be a lot of pushback on this because I do think a lot of um, civil rights and employment attorneys, uh, it sounds like from the comments, a lot of them do have such clauses and, and are very wedded to them. It's going to be, in, look, and it would go out for another round of public comment. We will hear other smart voices. I mean, this is not, uh, I don't want to do anything hasty or silly, but I, I, I think after really looking at these comments and going back and looking at the cases that we noted in the uh, draft opinion, that Scapa Brown case found it to be a disciplinary offense among many, many others that were very egregious. So I'm not saying that they found someone just for this. A disciplinary offense to, in a contingent fee agreement, um, have this non-contingent automatic fee, regardless of hours worked, regardless of contingency, and, and the reason they found it was because they're saying the attorneys knew how it's supposed to work with quantum Merowit under Perkasi, right? And they knew that uh, a, a clients can always fire their lawyers. And, and the implication for that is you can't contract around this. This is like a public policy. You can't get around it that way. It's an ethical thing. So, but I, I really do want to know, because this will be a bunch of work for us. And, uh, and if people are have objections or just unease with it, we'd love to know first because uh, we don't want to waste anyone's time. And, you know, Brandon, I would just add too that, you know, I, I, I don't know the stats, but but it, it, it it's not that rare of an issue because I know, you know, here at the uh, county bar fee arbitration level and then a, a number of times at the state bar level, um, you know, I've seen requests, you know, for fee arbitration, you know, and, and the issue being, you know, attorney versus attorney yeah. is not something that's within the jurisdiction of the fee arbitration program. And, and but those kinds of issues pop up, not infrequently, but are generally declined for loss of jurisdiction. But I've seen a number of cases you know, the, the, you know, and even a few that I've had to rule on where it's basically, you know, it, it realistically is kind of an attorney versus attorney, attorney one versus attorney two, but the poor client stuck in the middle. Yeah. And the client has requested fee arbitration of that dispute. Uh, and I have approved jurisdiction on, on, on several of those, depending on how it's phrased, because, you know, the client's taken a position and they want to have yeah. it resolved in fee arbitration. Uh, and, you know, and that, you know, those cases have gotten resolved in that fashion. So I, it, it's an issue that, yeah. that I think, you know, we, we really do need to address and if you know, if shutting the door is the, the, the ultimate answer, then I think we should do that and not hedge our bets. Anyone besides the three uh, uh, fee dispute uh, focused practices here? I, I just had a, a follow-up question for you, Brandon, because it seems that, um, you know, a lot of your, some of your reasoning, at least for, um, revising the, the draft, I think, and um, to make it an outright prohibition um, is based on this, um, I forget, Scapa Brown case, if I'm saying saying it right. Yes, yes. Um, and in that case, which I, I have to admit, I haven't reviewed carefully, but I, I do know that um, based on the parenthetical that's in the current draft opinion, it seems like that's a situation where um, the conversion clause um, relating to the minimum hourly fee, one of the factors was it was regardless of the amount of work that had been performed. That's right. And That's so right. I don't know that it that case itself directly prohibits any type of um, conversion clause. Um, so that, that that's just something to consider. I, I know there are 
other reasons you, you expressed, but I, I just. Yeah, Sarah, the, the response I have to that comment is that the value of the work performed is compensated by your right to uh, your comparative share of the reasonable value of your work that helped bring home the contingent fee. So that's why I wouldn't distinguish Scapa Brown from this situation. I would find it in support of the situation of closing the door. So Sarah, you're I think you raise a really good point because you know we would need a whole slew of cases with the different parameters to really nail it down. But there's a line in the Scapa Brown case where it says. They say, you know, um, the, the fee contract purporting to be a contingent fee agreement committed most clients to a minimum of $600 in legal fees if they discharge respondents involuntarily and regardless of it, whether any work was done to justify the minimum fee. So that is a pretty extreme example. But then they say, uh, the decision says, respondents were always aware that on discharge, they were limited to a recovery of the reasonable value of the services rendered, which is a, a statement that to me, has to be read as saying you can't contract around this principle. I'm not sure. I mean, but that's kind of how I'm taking it. Um, because to say that respondents are aware that upon discharge, you can only get the reasonable value of your services is to suggest that that can't be contracted around because they contracted around it. Yeah. And the court doesn't say, well, I don't know. I mean, I take I, the point. I, I don't, yeah. I, I think... I understand that sentence, you know, and reasonable value is what you, you're equating to, to quantum merit. Right. But I just, I don't think it really directly states that in all situations, your, your the attorney is limited to quantum merit. If the conversion clause were to work out to a, a reason, it was, was considered reasonable. I, um, I, where, where it was tied somehow to the amount of work that had been performed or, or was tied more, you know, as opposed to the extreme example in that particular case. So I just don't, I don't read that line the, the, the same way. I'm, I'm not saying I disagree necessarily with the ultimate conclusion and what you're proposing. I, I just wanted to, to flag that concern I had. That's a great, but see, that's the whole crux, uh, Sarah. And I totally agree with you that that's, really important, like how much flows out of the sentence I just read. And obviously we can have different levels yeah. of confidence in what is prohibiting, right? Um, so I, I think that's a great point you're making. I, I do read it a little more powerfully than that, but I understand that it's not, it's just not hundred percent clear. It's not saying, what I'm inferring from it is that you cannot contract around this principle that a discharge contingency attorney only gets quantum merit. That's how I read it. But it, I wish it had. I wish it actually said that those words in that order. Yeah, my only suggestion is, and I know we'll probably vote on whether to make your. I guess you first have to make those revisions because you don't have a revised. Did you revise it? No, no. Yeah. yeah. So I would just suggest if you if we do revise it for that particular point that. Um, maybe just consider <laughs> consider my comment and, and yes. cite me to the what what you cite to that case for what proposition and maybe yes. parentheticals or quotes would be helpful. I I think. Yes. So, and I see uh, Raquel, you have your hand raised. I do. I have a couple of questions and maybe a position based on the answers. Um, Brandon, how did this opinion come to Kropak who? I think opinion, it was me. But the issue. The issue. I think it was so my you, idea. You, okay. Um, and the unethical part that we're trying to deal with, if you just say specifically, what's the behavior that makes the um, conversion an ethical issue? Over so now? there are a couple ethical rules that we kind of pin it on. Um, with respect to settlement decisions, rule 1.2 gives clients the ultimate settlement decisions. And conversion clauses, uh, many of them would operate to penalize a client for exercising his or her right to make a settlement decision. Um, they would interfere with that right or burden that right in a way that we think is ethically impermissible. As to the termination, 
a, a, a client has an absolute right to terminate her or his attorney at any time with or without cause. And these conversion clause would also um, interfere with that right. And so we were walking sort of a balanced approach there that I'm suggesting we should go all the way and say, you know, any conversion clause that purports to entitle a terminated and contingent fee attorney to more than the reasonable value of, of their services compared against the final result obtained and the work performed by replacement counsel is unethical. And then the, finally, we were talking about an unconscionable fee. A lawyer cannot seek or collect an unconscionable fee. And there are circumstances here. So in a contingency fee arrangement, you typically have the chance at a higher fee because you're taking the risk that you get no fee at all, right? Right, and right. When, when these lawyers draft a contract where they get that upside risk, but then they build in a, a, a floor where they're definitely getting paid no matter what, Mm -hmm. Our view is that that's unconscionable. You're not actually taking the risk. You're just taking more money, right? So those, that, I mean, in a nutshell, that was the, the approach that we were taking to it. Yeah. Also, okay. Rachel, Rachel, on that point, there is a line of cases which talks about that what makes the contingent percentage reasonable is the amount of the risk. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in the, if it's a highly risky case, the fee can get up to close to 50%, but not over it. Mm -hmm. And in, if there is a high contingent percentage, but an extremely low risk, that high percentage can be found to be unconscionable. So you're already balancing into your fee uh, that you're gonna get, the risk you're taking. And if then if you hedge the risk, the fee you've set, the percentage you've set, is not reflective of the risk you're taking. And it's unfair to the client. It's almost misleading to the client. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I would be in support of closing the door. I think when you take a contingency, you assume the risk and it does put the responsibility on you to make sure you're able to take it to the to the finish line or you have some issues for you for yourself over time. I do think it it and because the idea of access to justice. I do think that, you know, most people who are doing contingency is because, so no matter how many other people that they could go to, that's really irrelevant. It's just really like uh, contingency in the whole field. And so I do think as we think about it, we should not give loopholes because there's other people someone could go to. I just think we should close that. Um, is there some, something somebody said a few minutes ago where the, there sometimes becomes a debate between the first lawyer or the, I don't know if this is too legal of a ter term, but the discharge lawyer, the one that gets fired and the second one yeah, arguing about how much the first one should get because it takes it out of their, is, is it, um, improper that actually it's somehow more related to the um, amount of money that the client gets because so, they may like, so how, how is that another So what would happen way? If, oh. in the classic scenario, let's say you have an attorney um, and she'll take the case for one third of the recovery and, you know, a contingent case. And then partly through that attorney client relationship ends, second attorney has a similar one third contingent fee and then they, they get a million dollars. So $333,000 is the attorney fee. Now attorneys number one and two need to establish as between each other, right. get what amount of money. And, um, and, and in the best of all worlds, the client's not part of this dispute. Right. Now, when attorney number one has something that says, if I get fired, Upon the contingency, I get my reasonable hourly rate of $3,000 an hour. Um, that is going to be something that attorney number two is not going to live with. And there's going right. to be a fight. And based upon some case law, which we have no influence on, that fight's probably going to pull the client into a legal battle um, that the client probably has no desire to be involved in. So I get my question is more about making the Okay, so the lawyer is already has a high degree of risk. 
making some of the risks be shared by the client. In other words, I have the yeah. right to let go, but at the end of the day, I also, because I made that decision, well, I need to Andy up more than I would have had I not, and not have the lawyers fighting. And so I just don't know though. Is that so there's a whole there's a whole yeah. body of case law on this issue okay. as to when okay. an attorney who when the attorney quits, mm -hmm. when it's justifiable withdrawal and they've waived their right to fees or not, that's pretty involved. That and we cite we cite to it. We don't explore it much. It's the Russ Miliband line of cases. Um, yeah, so, also, so the so the client will not take any kind of no, risk, basically. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, and in fact, uh, under the rules, I can't remember the rule number because I really bad at converting from the old rules to the new ones. But uh, any, if there were a written agreement between the two attorneys to split that contingent fee, one of the requirements of that rule not only do you have to have the client's consent but that it can't increase the cost of the client. And in the all but one or two of these cases where I've testified as an expert, uh, the attorneys now have released the client's share from their uh, trust account. And then the two attorneys are left to figure out who gets what. Yeah, so that's messy. I see why, <laughs> I, yeah, I see that some of the issues. I guess a, re a suggestion if we decide to redraft it and seek a, uh, opinions is to proactively seek out people um, that deal with clients that are doing contingency field, uh, contingency, because that kind of, I don't know, uh, Brandon, you talk about access to justice. So whoever those probably nonprofit type of organizations or some of the law firms that do that, because we may um, we probably would hear a different lot from the other side, from the client side. And, well, and from the, or as far as the attorneys that are saying it's an access to justice issue, the attorneys that do contingency fee agreements with conversion clauses, we did get a lot of public comment from them. So we've, we've seen that point of view. Um, and, you know, I represent, I think many of us do, uh, clients on, uh, uh, contingent fee basis from time to time, sometimes hourly, sometimes contingent. Um, so I think, you know, I think we've got a good bead on the dynamics and the necessity for um, uh, for contingent fee as an access to justice issue. When people sure. can't afford hourly fees and there are contingent fee lawyers that believe in the case, you know, they're going to get a contingent fee. And even if discharged under the law as it already exists, unless, you know, under most circumstances, they're entitled to the reasonable value of their fee once there's a recovery from the replacement attorney. Um, so we did. We did also. I think, uh, Brandon, tell me if I'm wrong, but didn't a fair amount of the attorney comments come from CAOC related uh, things? So we know what they're thinking. Yeah, those organizations are, you know, attorney protective organizations, or you know, union or whatever you would say. Right. Uh, so we know what they're thinking, and of course, they want to they want to get as much as they can. And the problem with it is that not only is it unsupported by the law, then it works out to be extremely unfair to the client for both of those reasons that Brandon's talked about earlier. So I guess mine is. I don't know, because I don't know enough about the agencies, but let's just say, I don't know, the Association of African-American, right, who are actually dealing with the poor people who need this. And I'm saying, let's hear what people from those organizations say, because maybe we're making some assumptions about whether the people right. can pay or not pay or whatever, like, so, so, so not the traditional, you know, lawyers, but the, the people that are really working on the ground. And so I know there's legal aid and there's, you know, all of those kind of organizations. So let's get to the, the people for whom we're saying just this is helping. Um, right. So, I mean, yeah, and honestly, that, that that's sort of the purpose of the public comment period. And we did get a huge amount of public comment from people doing civil rights litigation, employment litigation, and making the argument to us that 
the only way these folks can get access to the courts is with contingency fee agreements. And the only way we as a lawyers can afford to represent them is with these conversion clauses. And, and I don't wanna pretend, you know, I don't agree. I, I, I don't agree, but I take that position very seriously. I just come around to the conclusion that um, it's still unethical. And, and especially when you say, these are people that can't afford to pay hourly fees. If you have a conversion clause that would obligate them to pay an hourly fee, it is prohibiting them from exercising their client rights to terminate a lawyer or to determine settlement and things like that. And, I, and I'm very troubled by it, but I'm not dismissive of the argument they're making at all. And so we've, we're trying to think about that and, and say we've, you know, even considering everything they're saying, we come out the other way. But I, you know, I, I don't know if people on the committee disagree. And, and uh, we don't want to take the committee anywhere it doesn't want to go or waste anyone's time. Um, I, I'm skeptical for a couple of reasons. Some of them are process reasons. Um, and it goes a little bit to the exchange you had with Sarah, Brandon, about the language that you wish you had in that case. Right. But it is not there. Right. So what is COPREC's role in this instance where we may all agree that a thing should be banned outright, but we're not a policymaking body, we're not a court, we're not finding things, we're not hearing testimony, we don't have expertise as a body. Sarah said, you know, announce an interpretation that leaves it open that it, there isn't an outright ban. What is COPREC's authority to say something that isn't in the black letter of the case? I don't think it's a legal conclusion. I think the committee, if it is the opinion of the committee, can say, you know, we think this is ethically impermissible. We think that these rules that we've cited, 1.2, you know, 1.5, that that they are being violated, that this term is violative of them. And But uh, typical of the Copreg opinions would be like, in these instances, this type of thing would violate these rules but you're talking about doing something else which is to say mm -hmm. you can't do it and the second right. thing is you can't do something that is in certain practices apparently very widespread currently you know coprax done that before there's that whole uh thing about um withdrawing the man freedy thing where everyone used to go in camera and say judge it's privileged. I can't tell you how terrible my client is. Well, let's go into chambers and I'll just tell you how terrible he is and you'll let me out of the case. And right. Corporate said, you can't do it. And it was, right. and I unfortunately kind of remains something that is in practice. And they said, that's ethically prohibited. But I take your point. This is not what we normally do. So yeah. No, and that's I mean, on I'm the withdrawal question, you that, that opinion made it pretty much like a crazy dance where you had to say, I want to withdraw for some reason. I can't tell you what the reason is. Right. And you need to read, and the judge says, well, I need to know the reason, and then nothing yes. happens. Yeah, right. uh, Daniel, uh, many times COPRAC has opined about an ethical issue in the absence of black letter law in California by looking to other jurisdictions for how they've handled that same issue. And there's more than ample uh, examples from many other jurisdictions that have said the same thing. And just because this one case may not have gone to say it specifically, it certainly didn't do anything inconsistent with what we're suggesting. And it is supported by authority in other jurisdictions. Right, but even one of our members, Sarah, just announced, you know, just sort of detailed one alternative interpretation of it. I could come up with others. And, and certainly if I had a vested interest in it, I would, people will. It's a question of whether it's sufficient to say, what 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 does the ban get you that justifies taking the risk that you're out too far ahead of that opinion? Well, so I would actually, I really appreciate what you're saying here. And I, I would actually frame it from the, what is our opinion? What is the, what the opinion of the committee as to whether or not conversion clauses are ethically uh, impermissible and under what circumstances. And once we arrive at that opinion, then I would sort of assess the idea of like, oh, are, are we going to make too many waves? Are we going out too far over our skis? Because right now, I don't even know if people, 
I'm not asking about how it will be received, but I'm not the people on this Zoom. I don't even know if if people. But on I'm, this Zoom I'm, are I'm so, sorry to interrupt, but I'm I'm saying like we should put an intermediate step in there, which is, is there very specific and unassailable authority if we're going to overturn something that is widespread in certain practices mm -hmm. that we could point to because we don't I don't think have the authority to make policy even though we may believe it well it's not it's not policy it's it's supported by the ethical rules that we've cited and it is supported by the other uh, authorities from other jurisdictions and this morning we just talked about rule 8.3 where the public comment was half Half of the people who commented said we shouldn't be doing this, but we're doing it. And, and so if we're going to bend because the, the public policy or somebody's not going to like what we're doing, um, I'm not sure that that is. Well, that's not really what I'm proposing, but I'm, I'm just saying stopping short of an outright ban because, you know, there was Brandon enunciated why I wish the case said this. If it did, then we wouldn't really need the opinion. It would have been banned. Why do we have the opinion? Because there's no case that says it's banned in every instance. We would be doing that. No, we have the opinion or we want the opinion because too many lawyers who know better, as did the lawyers in Scaffrey and Brown, are ignoring their duties to their client. They're or they're doing the it because there's no case that says they can't do it. Well, right? and, and no the ethical opinion. Right, right. So no, I, I take your it's point. My hesitation. Really, it's my hesitation. It's, it's just the hesitation. Well, but, but Daniel, that was the exact hesitation I had in our initial draft, too, which was um, exactly what you're talking about. And so we did like a three quarters measure. And, you know, some people view that as implying if we don't shut the door, are we saying, you know, but but see if you can figure out a way to get away with it. It'll be fine. You know, like, yeah, sure. I, I see um, Justin has his hand raised, so I'd like to hear from Justin on this. Yeah, so um, I feel like we're sort of going back to a conversation we had earlier, and, and I had a vague recollection in my mind that I previously cited some cases from other jurisdictions that said that you could recover more than quantum merit. And so I spent the last 15 minutes trying to find those cases to make sure I wasn't making that up. I think I found a different case than I previously found from a different jurisdiction, finding that if a, if a client terminated a lawyer in a contingency fee situation without cause, the, the lawyer could still collect its entire contingency fee from the client's eventual recovery, i.e. more than just quantum merit. And so this kind of, for me, triggers triggered in my mind what I think I had said previously, which is that um, if, if that clarity of law is does not exist in California, I mean, I don't think it does. And, and, you know, Joel saying there are jurisdictions that would support a conclusion that, you know, goes all the way, but there are Clearly, jurisdictions like Texas, where I just read from, which I found to be generally consistent with California's views on other ethical issues, but in any event, they go the other way and say, no, there isn't this total um, ban on recovery more than quantum merit. Then personally, for me, I'm, I'm not comfortable, even if I understand the logic of it and the rationale of it, I'm not comfortable going all the way if, if we don't, because I feel like it is at least in part a legal question, um, whether you can recover more than quantum merit in, in a particular situation. And Absolutely. so given this kind of <laughs> murkiness, at least for me personally, I'm, I'm not comfortable going all the way. I think we've kind of ping ponged on that issue a number of times and I'm still not, I'm still not persuaded to change it. And it's not that I, don't understand or don't necessarily agree with why we might want to go that all the way. But it's for those reasons that I just described that I, I just, I, I'm not comfortable personally. Justin, I'm curious in, in Texas or in one of those other jurisdictions, do they have a case that we have, which says that you're entitled to quantum merit or is this their solution for the lack of such a, a reward for the client for the first attorney? The case that I'm reading right now 
distinguishes between when the client does and does not have good cause. So it's looking into, I think this concern that maybe some of the public commenters have raised is when when your client is is a so-called bad actor in, in terms of not willing, being willing to settle or something like that, is it really fair to limit the lawyer to quantum merit? And at least in this case, which I'll send you guys um, so you can take a look at it, the court draws a distinction between with and without cause. Now, you, you may be able to say, well, that's not the law in California, or we could distinguish that, but I don't, at least sitting here, <laughs> I don't think we've drilled down deep enough to say that, no, this is completely distinguishable. This is, this is not how we do it under the Fercasi case or, or other authorities where it's just so clear that you can never recover more than quantum merit. I, I, I certainly agree that it would be an extreme, extreme and rare situation, but to say that it could never happen, at least given these competing um, views, uh, in terms of how we would like to interpret California law, what we have available to us under mm -hmm. California law, and what at least I'm seeing in other jurisdictions, I'm not personally prepared to go all the way and say there is no circumstance ever under which a terminated lawyer in, in these circumstances could recover more than quantum merit. Hey, Justin, you know, I would like to see that case because I'm curious whether it's, uh, you know, whether that's how they dealt with the, what the fee was or it's based on a clause in a fee agreement. Because there's already, yeah, send, law, I'm there's already law in California that, you know, the deals with the bad faith clients, you know, such that, you know, if the client, you know, you know, for without cause or for bad reasons, you know, terminates the lawyer literally on the courthouse steps. There's authority that, you know, the reasonable value uh, quantum merit could be the full contingent fee. And I don't think this opinion that we're talking about eliminates that. Ours is more addressed with fee clauses that, you know, try to hedge the bet, so to speak, uh, and put the client in a bind um, based on a contract provision that the lawyers, you know, trying to push on them. Yeah, also, Justin, in, in my experience, I've been an expert on, I think, about five or six of these attorney versus attorney cases. And in every situation, the court or the arbitrators took into account the value that each attorney brought to the case. And that value would be limited by the contingent amount, no matter what. And in one case, I think uh, they were dividing up a $1.7 million fee. One side got, uh, one lawyer got 42,000 and the other lawyer got the rest. So those things are taken care of, but, um, what who suffers is the client. So I have a proposal. Um, and I think maybe um, uh, Ken and Joel and I should do like a bullet point memo with our authorities and squibs. And we should look for contrary authority in California and maybe outside of the jurisdiction. And then, in, and then we'll sort of circulate that and invite other committee members to to, so, so that we have the universe of materials in front of us and can see if we reach a consensus on this. Because I, you know, I'm i very, very respectful and mindful of what, what everyone's talking about here. Um, and uh, obviously, I'm capable of changing my mind on this because I've gone a couple different directions over the course of this opinion already. But I, but I, I've, I want to look at all the, the authorities, because I do think California authority is already pretty clear. There's a single contingent fee. You can't exceed quantum merit, I think. But, but, you know, if we're not there today, let's keep looking. But, yeah, I'd like to start with Justin's cases and have anybody else who thinks that we're exceeding our authority or going too far forward us the authority they think that comment is based on, and we'll come back and answer it. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to that point, Joel, um, and it's already cited in your um, 
a draft opinion, but there is the Colorado Bar Association ethics opinion that uh, doesn't support a, a per se prohibition and, and says all these factors have to be considered and has to be analyzed on a case by case basis. And I, I tend to agree with the reasoning in that, that ethics opinion. And so I think that should be part of the memo just because it's one authority um, contrary to what we're considering. And the one point that, you know, as we're considering these, since there doesn't seem to be a clear authority in California, as we're considering authorities from other jurisdictions, I, I think we should also evaluate how their rules of professional conduct compared to our rules. One distinction that I'm aware of is just, you know, we're relying on, in part, uh, I think the conclusion that's um, being proposed is that the conversion clause would violate rule 1.5. And our rule 1.5 refers to an, an unconscionable fee where other jurisdictions adopt the ABA model rule, which to me is a lower standard as an unreasonable fee, not merely, not an unconscionable fee. So that, that's another reason why I, I am a little bit, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with the outright prohibition. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. And I, the other just question I had, and this is more for um, Erica or Angela's, and I might've just overlooked this, but I did not see the public comments um, as part of the agenda materials. And I don't know if they were part of the prior agenda. I, I couldn't find them quickly on the Coprac library, but I'd love to look at- It was at a long time ago. It was a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, but if, if we could um, circulate those again, I, I, I would really like to look at them yeah. further too, as we evaluate this. And Sarah, I can, if I may I just can add circulate to, them and put them on the SharePoint. I'll let everybody know in an email. Perfect. Thank you. Sarah, that, that Colorado ethics opinion is excellent. And but but one thing that I think, if I'm remembering correctly, is different in Colorado is that they did not have a default to quantum merit for a discharge contingency fee attorney. So some of the conversion clauses they were talking about were saying we either get our contingent fee or if we're fired, we get the conversion is to quantum merit which is already the baseline in California, which is a little bit of a different, um, you know, different context. But but I agree with you. That's a that's a very well-reasoned ethics opinion, the Colorado opinion. Yeah, it addresses the situation where, you know, it says a conversion clause that to quantum merit, it, it is permissible. Right. And then it says conversion clauses to maybe a Lodestar or some other alternative fee arrangement could be permissible depending on the facts, including whether it's a for right. cause termination or not, the timing of when the payment would be due. There are a lot of factors that it analyzed. So it wasn't just limited. I didn't read it as limited to just the quantum merit is permissible. It, it was saying on an alternative fee arrangement, conversion I agree with you. could be permissible. Yeah, I agree with you. So, I don't know if there's other feedback we want to discuss, or I really like your idea, Brandon, to come back for our next meeting with with the with a memo. Um, so I'll just pause to see if, you, if there's anything else you wanted to raise. Okay. I have a comment um, related, I guess, to what Brandon said. I, I'm looking at the strategic plan, um, and I guess it's related to what Justin said as well. And in some way, our conversation has been more about protection of the client, but in some way, Justin's comment is more, and maybe a little, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'll just say, Justin, I'm not sure exactly about Daniel's. Uh, Daniel's just seemed to say, <laughs> are we stretching something that doesn't exist? because we'd like to exist. I think that's how I, I understood what Daniel was saying. But Justin was in this other conversation is more protecting lawyers from bad actors. And my sense is there's more bad actors that are attorneys than there are of clients, right? So that, that, that would be my sense. But into, into the strategic plan, I think just the committee should just look at that because goal two talks about protecting the public by enhancing access to and inclusion in the legal system. And it goes to this idea, you know, we, we need to look at improving maybe some of the, regula the regulatory, some of the ways we've done things. And to me, this kind of gets to that. If you, if you frame it 
in the access to justice. Um, so I remember like, I think I, when we, when that was presented, there was something in there that maybe ties to this and um, so I don't know, there may be some, like I say, it's more related on the client side. So it may be give the committee some other um, framework and principle that allows us to hang on it versus some kind of cases or regulation, but really saying this is where the bar is trying to go. And so therefore, if we haven't been there, we're not going to have any deep um, practice about it because it's like an acknowledgement that we have not done it, but we want to do it. So it's goal two and it pretty clear in the strat plan over. So I have a quick question, Sarah. Is there opening for the uh, to be on this particular committee or is this something separate? Um, are you referring, I, I'm not sure which committee. The, the, the conversion clause committee? Is that the one yeah. you're talking about? Oh, okay. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know how many we have on it at the moment because I don't have it in front of me, but there's I don't either, but how many, but we might, there might still be room. I think it's just the three of us, right? Paul and Ken and Elf. I can't remember. We're the only three who showed up on the Zoom meeting. So I think you could have four, <laughs> if I'm correct. It, uh, the key is that's thing you'd be interested in joining. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. The working group, technically. Yeah. Working group. That's what Sorry. I'm thank oh, you, yeah. That's the terminology <laughs> I was looking for, the working group. Um, OK. So that's great. And I think. Um, Maybe we should move on to the next agenda item, which is the draft um, ethics opinion on illegal contract provisions. And that's something that um, I'll, I'll, I can lead the discussion on and I, I welcome feedback from the other members of the working group and, and everyone more generally. Um, this <laughs> um, went out for public comment previously, just to some background. Um, and then ultimately it was kind of put on hold because there was a board of trustee uh, who's now a former board of trustee member who raised some concerns about the opinion. Um, but before I get into those um, concerns raised, um, you know, part of the is issue that this, um, the example given in this ethics opinion is a non-compete agreement that is unlawful and not subject to any exception. Um, and I think there was a lot of public comment and including issues raised by the former board of trustee about, well, you know, it's it's very rare to have a contract provision that is unlawful um, in every instance or that would, um, you know, just entering into an agreement that contains an unlawful provision would not necessarily be a violation of the rules of professional conduct. And I'm, I'm, that's a very high level summary, but um, there are, have been some very recent developments um, in that there's proposed bills pending um, both on the state and, and federal side that kind of touch upon similar issues. So unfortunately I forgot to ask that those be included as part of the agenda items for this meeting. I think they, it might have been for a prior meeting, but there is a proposed, um, and all three of these are still in the stages. Two of them have been put in the suspense file, meaning they likely won't be considered for, for quite some time, um, where it's found that their monetary impact would be more than 150,000. But they address very similar issues, um, and some of them report to just restate our existing uh, case law. But um, I don't know that we need to put them all on the screen. I can try, try to briefly summarize them, but there's one AB 747, and um, Erica had flagged that previously. And then there's some others um, too that are slightly more limited to AB 747, which is SB 69, 699, and AB 1076. Um, so the two, Later ones I mentioned have been put in a suspense file. The 747 will be considered in May, May 18th at the Senate Appropriations Committee, but I, that one, unfortunately, that one is no longer relevant. It's been revised further and, and narrowed so that the other two are still somewhat relevant. And they would just make clear that uh, non-compete agreements are unlawful. 
um, and would some one of them propose to subject a lawyer to discipline for entering into an agreement with an uh, unlawful non-compete. Others, uh, the the federal one and one of the state ones, the FTC bill would clarify that that a non-compete violated was constituted unfair competition, and um, the FTC one would address that. And then the, there's a pending uh, proposed California bill that would state that it similarly non-compete would violate California's unfair competition law. So I, I wanted to raise those to see how that might impact our opinion. And although our opinion is intended to be broader than just non-competes, that was just one example provided in the, in the draft opinion. Um, if, in my opinion, if one of these bills were to um, pass, it would it would kind of make very clear that the agreement itself, entering into the agreement itself is unlawful. Um, and therefore it would kind of strengthen our, our opinion um, and a lot of the feedback we've received. Um, on the other hand, I know that many feel that, um, you know, the opinion is broader than that, not limited to non-compete. And we, we have a lot of clarifications in the opinion to make clear that it's only a non-compete agreement that is unlawful and not subject to any exception. Um, but I'm gonna pause I, about, and I don't know if it might be helpful to just hear others' thoughts on the impact of these proposed bills on, on the draft opinion. And if you think, um, what one suggestion is we could mention them in a, in a footnote, we could, um, we could cons consider to kind of hold on how, this opinion until there's an opportunity. I, I think the federal, the only one that I think might have a likelihood of being considered further is the one that the FTC is considering because that one public comments were received in sometime in April, mid-April. Um, and there is a pending rulemaking. So that could proceed faster um, than the California bills that are have been put in the suspense file. So I don't know if we should kind of table this opinion or uh, consider it further um, and just note these pending bills. So what are others thoughts? My recommendation would be wait to see what the bills, what the outcome of the bills are going to be. Um, Sarah, this is Cassidy. Um, what, what is the, um, I haven't looked at this in a while, but what yeah. are other examples other than a non-complete clause, um, where a clause is clearly a violation or, unla or clearly unlawful? Like have, you know, what else is it, would this apply to other than non-compete clause, clauses? I'm trying to pull because actually I think there might have been one example given. Let me just see. I mean, other than, you know, like a contract for hire killing <laughs> or, you know, like things that are clearly yeah. you know, like criminal and, you know, um, because it was my, you know, understanding that this, this opinion really came about because of the scenario described in the opinion and the pervasiveness of the abuse of non-compete clauses and the effect it has on you know chilling employees rights to um to you know move between companies and that sort of thing um so you know and i and i agree with vikita in that respect because maybe it should just be limited to what's clearly unlawful under these new bills because otherwise it does I think it does present ambiguity as to what lawyers can advise on. Anyway, those are my thoughts. 
Yeah, and the one thing I, I know this is still in the employment law context, but um, and it's referenced. I don't know if we could go to the page. I think it's referenced at a footnote or somewhere else. There's, there's a labor code provision, I think 432.5. It's in here. I can try to, um, which says it. Let's see what it says exactly. I try to find it on my end. Footnote 16. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that one, yeah, you're on the and right now. That one would say that no, it prohibits an employer from requiring any employee to agree in writing to a condition the employer knows is prohibited by law. Um, so I think there could be other examples as well in the employment law context or employment agreements beyond non-compete that could be contained in an employment law agreement that would be just prohibited by law, such as refusing. I'm just you know, refusing to pay minimum wage or overtime as an example. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so I, I know that's an egregious type of an example, but I, I, I don't know. I don't think we should necessarily Limited. you are correct that this opinion arose based on the, the non-compete was the context. And but I don't think it should necessarily be limited to the, the non-compete. At the same time, I'm not opposed to kind of waiting a little bit and see what happens with this pending legislation before we um, consider acting further on the draft ethics opinion, because I, I think that will be helpful um, if there are developments. Um, yeah. And then I know there are some other examples too, because, and it's it's been a long time because this was, <laughs> given this was delayed on agendas, but I know there are some other examples outside of the employment context that some of the public comments have have raised, it's, it's just not coming to my mind at the moment. Yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, um, anyone from the uh, working subgroup have, do you have any suggestions on um, what to do with the draft opinion in, in light of the pending bills? I don't remember if I'm on the subgroup, but I know that we and you, you, me and Brandon talked about this opinion. And I think that um, some of the red lines that are included in the, the current draft um, are really helpful in addressing some of the questions or concerns that were raised uh, about our, our draft that was sent to the board. And so I think we've made some, some good progress there, but I can still see that, um, there's probably going to be areas where we're going to need to spend time further refining, further clarifying. And if we have to do that anyway, once the, you know, assuming legislation is passed, it might be more efficient to do it all at once. Um, you know, so maybe that counsels in favor of trying to get a better sense in the next meeting or two about timing of that legislation to the extent there's any visibility and then deciding, you know, whether whether and when we want to pick this up again and maybe instead focus on some of the other outstanding, um, you know, work that we have going on. Yeah, and that, I do kind of, I'm kind of leaning in that direction as well. And I do know in terms of just Timing briefly, I, I don't think we should necessarily wait for any action on the, the California proposed bills because the two that are still relevant are now in the suspense file. So I think there, uh, there's unlikely to be any resolution in the near future. But I do, the FTC one, like I mentioned, um, the public comments were in April. And so there's a docket that I can monitor in the FTC proceeding and rulemaking to just try to stay up to speed. Um, and I think hopefully we'll have a better idea by our next meeting. Um, so in light of that, um, does that, before I move on though quickly, does anyone feel that we should move forward and not wait a little bit to see what happens with the proposed bills? I have a question about that from the committee. 
what do you, where do you think you are? In other words, setting aside the potential legislation, where where is the committee? Do you feel you could do more based on what you've heard? If the answer is yes, I would say keep working so that you're able to be more nimble with whatever comes from the outside and just evaluate it and be closer to the finish line. Um, would be my thought again with the idea of having a, a more regular cadence of moving things forward is, is my thought. But I think if the committee says, hey, we have everything we need and we wouldn't do anything else, then, you know, then you wouldn't move, you wouldn't keep working over. So I think that just, just in terms of status, as I mentioned, this already went through a public comment round. So there have been revisions made already in, in response to public comments. Um, but, but actually, and then did it go out for a second? I think it went out for two public comment periods already, if I recall. So revisions were made in response to the first round of public comments and a revised opinion went out um, for public comment. And then very re more recently, revisions were made not based on public comments necessarily, but based on the board of former Board of Trustees feedback. And so I think we would have to evaluate um, based on those revisions that are redlined now and any other revisions the working group and COPRAC decides to make, whether they're substantive enough that it should go out for another round of public comments. Um, in my opinion, the outcome of this proposed bill um, that the FTC is considering wouldn't necessarily, especially since it's from the federal side, wouldn't necessarily change, in my mind, the ultimate conclusion in the draft ethics opinion. However, I think it would kind of help in terms of a lot of the public comments we've received that are just just feel like non-compete agreements um entering to, into a non-compete agreement is not unlawful um because it could clarify that in fact it is uh, unlawful and um violates the unfair competition law but i think that's part of the dilemma too is that that issue, some of the public comment is, it's more of an issue of law. And we're not trying to opine on that issue of law in the ethics opinion, we're really trying to focus on, you know, we're assuming that the agreement is unlawful as a matter of law, not subject to any exception that would make it lawful. And some of the changes we've made um, very recently, try to make that even clearer. Um, by moving some language from a footnote to the body and, and kind of emphasizing it even more. But um, I still think, even though I feel that the ultimate conclusion wouldn't necessarily change based on the outcome of the bill, it's, it's worth waiting just a short amount of time. I don't want to defer too long to see what happens with the proposed um, FTC bill. So not hearing others, I, I think what I'll plan, I think what I think makes the most sense is to kind of the working group members, if, if they could work on this more before the next meeting, consider additional revisions, and I'll continue to monitor the FTC docket uh, to see if there's, if we can get a better idea on timing, and that will inform our next steps. And on that um, note, could you remind me I know it's, I think Justin and Brandon are the two on this working working group. Is that right? I don't I don't remember if I was on the working group. I know I've been talking about it with, with you both. I just want to see if I can. Andrew, maybe, I don't know if I- uh, It's know. only you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah and Justin, you're the only two left <laughs> on that working group. <laughs> okay, that, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> so is there- is there anyone else who wants to be part of this, uh, the working group? 
so it would be great. To, usually we have three people and I think one of the members um, is no longer with us. So I'll, I'll definitely do that to Sarah. Great, thank you, Vikita. So I think with that plan, I'm gonna move on to the next agenda item, um, which is E7, and that's the discussion of cryptocurrency that Bill is going to lead discussion on. Yeah, uh, <laughs> not much has happened since this draft and I haven't, uh, I've revised it, but I haven't finished the revision. Uh, my time caught up with me in order to get it on the agenda for today's meeting. Um, Cause I re rearranged it and put some, uh, the, I think I added a hypothetical or I don't know if I had hypotheticals in this version, but I went back to the idea of putting hypotheticals back into it um, to, kind of clarify the point or the points that I was making or that we were making in, in the, the draft. So uh, this is a very rough draft. Um, and, and you know, originally Eleanor and I were, were talking and we were going back and forth and whether or not you know, a traditional retainer for future fees and expenses uh, would be permissible to use cryptocurrency if the if the law firm held the cryptocurrency in its in its electronic form as opposed to converting it to fiat currency and i think initially certainly my my thought was that couldn't comply with 1.15 with cryptocurrency as a retainer and keeping it in that form um i've since kind of gone back and forth and i, I i've come to the conclusion that you can, you just got to jump through a bunch of hoops and make sure you do everything consistent with 1.15. Um, and so my new version, which we don't have up yet, is addresses that and adds that into it, also adds a hypothetical uh, involving a retainer for future services and how, what the lawyer has to do to comply um, with that. And so, um, the next meeting, you'll, you'll have a, a pretty good draft um, for everyone to review well in advance of that. So plus in formatting wise, I just I changed the formatting um, to be more consistent with other other opinions. But uh, the next meeting, I should have a much better draft uh, that Eleanor and I can work on uh, and to have Justin look at as well um, to have it ready for the the group. Great. So is there any feedback you wanted from the members this time or you want to just wait until the next meeting? I mean, if anyone has if anyone has any feedback, I'd be sure certainly be interested um, that I can incorporate into my current draft that I'm working on. Okay, so it's okay. that good. So, so <laughs> Bill, I've got some handwritten notes that I'll I'll send you. I don't, okay. Um, I'll just send you what I have. Um, okay. By email. I don't. I don't need to take everybody's time on that. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. No problem. That sounds good. And I'll, I'll try. I think um, others, if if you could take a chance to look at the red lines before our next meeting, um, that that would be helpful. Um, so I'm going to move on now to the next agenda item, which is E1 the draft opinion on lawyer as an expert witness, um, which Justin recently presented on at our uh, ethics symposium. Um, but I, the revisions to this one, uh, just for everyone's knowledge, because I sometimes forget <laughs> given the delay in some of these, this opinion has not yet gone out for public comment. Um, I think it was kind of near near final and ready for public comment at the last meeting in which this opinion was discussed. And so the revisions that I'll go over very briefly now are, are fairly minor and just based on our discussion at the last meeting. So I think it might be helpful to just scroll through it and go to the red line so I can just mention quickly if when we get to a substantive one. This is just adding the relevant rules, obviously, um, that are discussed that we can double check to make sure it's comprehensive. 
this was a minor change just because there were two howevers. Um, yeah, that's minor. That's just, uh, let's see, I think there was really only one substantive edit made. Let's see. This is just more of a clarifying edit. Um, and then, yeah, here, I think this is actually might have been a mistake um, here. Um, I, this is saying C rule 1.4 B, which, and that's what it previously said. I, I think it might be helpful to keep in the, the parenthetical if this is the first time we cite to it. Um, I'm not sure why the parenthetical is removed. I might've done that inadvertently. Um, but I do think the parenthetical is helpful here the, fir the first time we cite to it. Um, but again, that is, that was a minor change, um, probably inadvertently made. And then if you could scroll down. Uh, what's been, yeah, if you could pause, if you could scroll, scroll up, this is near the end a little bit, just so I can see more on the screen. So we have, we, everything that's reflected in red line now and the high, highlighting, I'm not gonna go into it again, because we, we discussed it pretty thoroughly at our last meeting. And we, we were discussing the potential applicability of, of, of different rules here um, to address this as the fourth scenario. And ultimately we decided um, to just include a reference here to the duty of communication, um, 1.4B. And if you could, it's hard to see, let me just see if I can pull up. If you could scroll up, I'm sorry, to see what this modifies so I can explain it a little bit. Sure. And Justin, feel free to weigh in since you looked at this the most <laughs> recently with scenario four. Um, but I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so this is when we were evaluating what what port, what part of 1.4 might might apply to this type of scenario. And we ultimately decided it was 1.4 B, but I've got to pull up my own because I'm my memory is now fading. Yeah. I apologize. Justin, if you, uh, feel free if you want to. Yeah. So this this was probably my fault, and but I do ruminating about various hypotheticals that are unlikely to happen, but theoretically possible. And so we had a conversation about whether there might be a duty to communicate, uh, triggering at least some aspect of 1.4. Having now presented on this and thought a lot about this opinion. Honestly, I, I'm i fine with all of what you've done striking this section and in, in the interest of keeping our opinion, already complicated opinion streamlined. Uh, I don't I don't really have anything further. I, I, I would be in favor of getting this close to, you know, public comment. So I, I don't I don't feel the need to weigh in any further on including 1.4 here. Okay. I, I uh, if I may just quickly, I, I think the um the third scenario gives me a little heartburn to the extent it may compromise the attorney's duty of undivided loyalty. Imputed to the whole firm, right? I, I just think um I have a level of discomfort with the concurrent representation of a client and then another member of the firm acting as an expert adverse to the client. I don't have a case, uh, but I have discomfort with that, with the impact on loyalty there. And, and you know, a client's expectation of loyalty. Um, and I, I, I've talked about it before, so there's no reason to really go any further than that. I'm just not sure what to do with this feeling on the loyalty issue. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so Brandon, I you know again having just looked at this thoroughly for the for the uh, symposium, I I um can, I can understand where you're coming from. You know, you really have to think through the logic of this scenario, and it still doesn't necessarily jive with the feeling that you're expressing, right? Um, and so the, you know, I took a very close look at the Commonwealth case, and it's it's just right on point for this. I mean, it's this fact pattern scenario three. And the court goes through this carefully, and and, and in particular 1.7, which 
um, is our now is now our 1.7 and comes to this analysis that 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 it is ethically permissible what happens in scenario three. So um, point being how how it is described in scenario three is consistent with Commonwealth and its interpretation of 1.7. So unless we we find some way to distinguish Commonwealth or our our view of 1.7 in California. All of this tends to track, yeah. From, from that yeah. case, I haven't I haven't found anything that I perceive to be an error in this analysis, which is it, it's just sort of that spidey sense that I'm trying to figure it out. I'm going to go back and reread Commonwealth, and and then maybe I'll stop uh, whining with this because because I think this is really excellent work, and and I'm not in, in you know those instances where you can't articulate your discomfort. Um, at a certain point, you have to you have to name it or get over it. So I, I got to make a decision soon. Well, and I, mean, that's I agree with you, Brandon. I, it up. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I, I was going to say, I agree. I and partly feel like it's to do with the fact that I would never do this in my firm. Right. I would never right. permit it. Right. So how could it possibly be? Right. But yeah. And I, yeah, I understand <laughs> that, that concern as well. And um, in response, to, you know, I know Brandon's raised this concern at prior meetings too, and I, I've, I've looked into, you know, the California case law um, to try to, you know, see if, see if there's some, anything that, you know, might address this type of situation, um, and, and also looked at the Commonwealth case carefully too in the past that Justin mentioned, and I, I do agree that it, it fits within that um, case. And the other point I just want to make is that I, I do think it's great that we, you know, all the stuff that's been now deleted and, and highlighting that we discussed at the prior meeting, we are still making a recommendation here that the, the lawyers should discuss um, the potential risks and adverse consequences in this unrelated matter to the client under Rule 1.4b. So I, I think that is helpful to some extent in, in addressing maybe some of the some of the concerns. Um, But um, I'm going to pause, see if others have any comments on this last scenario, which is a concurrent concurrent expert um, and, and law firm in, in unrelated matters. So I what I propose, just because we've gone through this process several several times, and these these edits made based on our last meeting are. are Pretty minor um, non-substantive edits. I, I would suggest that we um, move to um, vote this opinion out. Uh, what in terms of whether it should be, go out for public comment? Has it I'll, never I'll gone out before? It has not gone out for public comment yet. Oh, okay, okay. I think that could be really, really useful. Yeah. Yeah, it's time. So. If anyone, and subject to any kind of minor cleanup edits that state bar staff and uh, we might make if there are any typos or stuff of that nature, but does anyone want to make a motion? I move to put it out for public comment. Yeah, I'll second it. All right, I am taking the vote uh, to put 20 triple one out for public comment. Bacon? Yes. Brown? Yes. Bradley? Shivers? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Mark? Yes. Mercado? Munoz? Yes. O'Reilly? Yes. Poindexter? Yes. Dar? Yes. And Benola? Yes. Excuse me, it's Elizabeth Bradley. Yes, also. Elizabeth, thank you. So uh, unanimous, um, the motion carries. Sorry, who was the second? Was that Bill? 11. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, that was me. Great. I, I Like everyone said, I, I'm happy to get some public comment on this point, particularly uh, scenario three that we've struggled with as a committee. Um, so... I'm going to move on to the next agenda item, which is E5, um, the ethics of in-house counsel 
and Cassidy will take the lead on this discussion. Hi everyone, um, this is gonna be quick. Um, I did make some red lines and edits. It's I think it's in a pretty good shape for a draft, but, um, and I proposed this to Sarah earlier that um, what I'd like to do is to get one volunteer to, um, after I take one last pass at it and draft the digest and the conclusion, to get a volunteer to go through it um, and just, you know, help me revise it, identify any issues, you know, red line, whatever. Um, and, um, and then we can present it either at the next meeting or at the August meeting, because I will not be there for the July meeting. Um, so, and unless anybody has any comment, if they if you've reviewed it, um, I, I'd be happy to take comments. But um, I think it's not quite ready to go over in detail. Um, I've been just kind of tinkering with it, um, but I, I just want a second set of eyes. And you know, I know we had the subcommittee meetings, but I feel like I just need one person to kind of focus on it with me. Mm -hmm. In kind of partnership. I, I could do that. I'm happy to do that. I Yay. have read it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I can criticize anything. I'll be yeah, happy to do I, that. I'm, you know, rip it apart. You know, that's totally fine. I just, I want, I, you know, I, I think it's easier to have a one on one um, discussion. Um, it might be more productive and then, um, then do the presentation and have a more robust discussion at one of the next meetings. That sounds great. So, um, hey Cassidy, I, I put together some comments. I'll okay. send you some bullet points so that you have those to consider as well. Like a second set of eyes on this. Thanks, thing. Justin. You're like doing all your homework. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I was, I thought, part of this committee, but my name is not on here. Yeah, so Raquel, yeah, you right. are Raquel, yeah. and so and so is Dan, and so are some you know other. It kind of fell apart, and that was my fault. I should have organized you know the subcommittee meetings better. Um, it just you know it's just hard to do that. So uh, what I what I like to propose is continue with having Dan review it, and then um, you know and then present it, and then and then maybe we can get the the band back together on the subcommittee meeting, and and you know and deal with more um, a, a more focused. Um, revisions um you know before it goes out for public comment for example yeah my comment is just more housekeeping so mm -hmm. not that i wanted to get on the committee so more to staff so um kayla Kayla, the name is still listed as someone who was who's on the committee but she's no longer right part of corporate and so i replaced her so um and so it's more for them not not for my desire to um, <laughs> do, do anything for Taylor. So I'm glad you proceeded as, as you did. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Raquel. I appreciate it. All right, Dan, I'll be in touch. <laughs> Great. And um, maybe if you could just, um, Cassidy, what I, I know, you know, timing is critical. So I, I like your plan of focusing on it and working with Dan, but if you could just copy the, the working group, maybe when you submit the final, um, revi not final, but the, the revised version for our next meeting, that way I'll, I'll be certain to more carefully look at it. Yeah, so do I know, is, it's in the, it's in the, the um, agenda who is actually on the- Correct, with the um, clarification that Raquel just noted, she should be in place of Kyla. Okay. Kyla's name is still listed. We'll do. Um, great. So I think the next agenda item is E2, um, and that's being led by Justin. So I'll let Justin take the lead. Sure. Okay. So this is the succession planning opinion. Um, my, the, I apologize to the subcommittee for not getting to this to you in time for input before the meeting, but if you have comments now, I'd welcome them. Um, what I tried to do that, you know, this this was largely the legwork of um, our colleague, Dina, and she got this in great shape. What I've tried to do for this round is to get it basically closer to hopefully public comment shape 
and address all of the remaining comments in some manner. So just starting with the digest, I cribbed from the highlights of the, the, the text and, and created a digest from there. No, no real magic there. That's the first change. Um, on around line, I'm in the red line, around line 78, I just streamlined some of the facts. There were some extraneous things there, just trying to simplify it and shorten it. Nothing major there. Um, at line 98, I just decided to change the, the age of the uh, hypothetical lawyer. 66 seemed kind of random. Uh, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was. That, that was my perception. And I thought maybe something even like 70 years might be more palatable to our audience, um, given what we're um, talking about here with succession planning of a, of a senior lawyer in that hypothetical. Then on uh, line 126, uh, I, I, there were some comments with site placeholders that, you know, again, trying to just streamline what we're talking about in this opinion. These issues about going on vacation, sabbatical, I think are subsumed in what we're talking about here and, and didn't really have, you know, concrete sites. So I just kind of, I took that out to, to streamline uh, the discussion. And then on uh, line 143, there was a comment to make a citation. So um, there I, I basically just filled in the um, site that's included in the rudder guide that is already referenced there. It's not the greatest site because, of course, we don't have the ABA model rule 1.3 comment 5 uh, in California, but that is what the rudder guide in California cites to. So perhaps before this becomes a published opinion, we will think about additional sites, but at least it's it's a step more refined than it was in our last iteration. Um, and then in addition, just some minor cleanup. I guess the only other substantive changes would be around line 217. I added a footnote just to highlight the concern issue about sharing confidential information. We, we have this point that the lawyer should make available things like passwords and access codes that might be necessary to get to client information should the lawyer uh, become incapacitated or unavailable. And so the footnote adds a reminder that in doing so, that reasonable steps should be taken to protect confidentiality and sensitive information. Uh, footnote nine is new. I, there was a citation to make reference to other succession planning opinions. And here with footnote nine in this area, we're talking about the role of an assisting attorney. So what I did there is found the bar association opinion that I thought had the best description of what an assisting attorney is and added the citation to that. So if a reader wants to learn more about that concept, um, he or she can, can go to that citation. And then let's see, just some other minor cleanup. I guess the only other substantive refinements would be around line 362. I changed this concept of what is the best approach to instead, what is, what is a reasonable approach? I think that's that phraseology is more consistent with how we analyze um, ethics issues, not, not necessarily what's best, but what's reasonable under the circumstances. And then finally, I added a conclusion um, to kind of wrap it all up so that we have a more final, complete draft to consider today. So that's really the gist. Um, welcome any thoughts, comments, things you think we need to change um, really with the goal of hopefully getting this out for public comment when we, we think it's ready, which is hopefully, you know, in the next few months, if not now. So with that, I'd open the floor to anybody who has thoughts.
Well, I think these are good changes. I, I read it previously and then again with these, and I think it's really, really close, if not totally ready to do its next thing. An opinion whose time has come, very timely. Well, we can thank your partner uh, for, for most of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dealing with this a lot too right now. Yeah, I, I agree with Dan and, and Justin, I'm just curious, um, what additional um, edits do you think are necessary to get it ready for uh, um, going out for public comment? In my own mind, um, none, but that's just me. So, uh, I, you know, look, I think it, it's 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 a complete piece of piece of opinion um, that will change based on what we get from public comment. Um, however, if anyone is seeing aspects of this that we need to really dig in deep before we send it out to public comment. I'm, I'm totally open to that, but I think it's a pretty complete um, draft as is. Um, so I, I, I would I would not have heartburn sending it out for public comment today. At the same time, we want to hold it for next session and, and make whatever edits uh, people raise today or, or just to think about it further. That's obviously fine with me as well. Um, either approach works. Yeah, Justin, speaking for myself, when I read it, I felt like this is ready for public comment. That's that's my two cents. Yeah, I I, I agree, which is why I was just <laughs> raised that question, but I see Raquel has her hand raised. So Raquel, did you have some feedback on the draft opinion? Uh, I do. I, I think I understood it. It seems like it has uh, what it needs. However, two things, and I probably was not on the committee maybe when this started, the conclusion. I, I feel like, again, from the public perspective and the idea of not, do no harm, that, the, that we should go further and say, you should be putting in a succession plan because I think that the risk of not doing it is detrimental to the public. And so I understand since I've been here, you know, the dialogue around, you know, some of the issues, et cetera, et cetera. And so I realized I may have missed the beginning, which got us to the conclusion that we were in, that maybe there's some reasons we can't go as far as I'm suggesting, but that, that would be my take. So I think it's says all the right thing, but it, in short, um, because if firms and the smaller the firm, the greater the problem, you know, you're one or two person firm and then you drop out and the implications on the client is dramatic. Um, so that's one thing that I say that doesn't have anything to do with, I, I mean, going out only because the conclusion I'm suggesting is different. Um, but also, is this an opportunity that we can um, execute the ideas we talked about, about making these opinions more streamlined? So this one is fairly in-depth. Um, so that's more a question to, I don't know, probably Justin, but, it, but I think overall, you know, the whole committee, since we had that conversation, and also is there, besides we have a template of the format, is there a way to put the conclusion also at the front so you don't have to read through the whole thing to kind of see or, or in some way maybe skip all of what we want people to read and they just go to the conclusion. So um, that is just the question and that's more of a format over. So yeah, sure. Thank you, Raquel. Um, let me try to address your comments. Um, so the reason that we uh, frame the discussion uh, in the way that we do, rather than saying that it is mandatory to do this, you must succession plan, it's for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the, the gist though, is that there are, there are these model rules, the ABA model rules that a lot of jurisdictions follow. And in the model rule, uh, there is a comment under rule 1.3 that talks about 
how a, a lawyer may need to um, engage, particularly sole practitioners, may need, under their duty of diligence, may need to succession plan. It doesn't say must, it says there are circumstances where it may, it may require. So it's, it's almost must, but it's not quite. Well, in California, we don't actually have that same comment. For whatever reason, uh, the Rules Revision Committee, the Supreme Court did not include that comment. So not only in the sort of model rule does it not require succession planning, it's close to must, but it doesn't quite require it. So we're a step removed from that in California in the sense that we don't even have that comment in the Rules of Professional Conduct that we've adopted. And so for, for that reason and some others, we've used a, a sort of careful way of describing what an, a lawyer's ethical obligations are, not, not going to the point where it's a, it's a must, it's a mandatory, because that's not necessarily supported by the rules that we have available to us in California. At the same time, we, we think that it's important enough to provide this guidance to lawyers for the reason that you described is because we want to be client protected. And so this opinion helps fill in that gap because we don't have that same comment like the model rules do. And we want to make sure that lawyers are thinking about these client protected ways of succession planning. So that's, that's why it is the way it is in terms of both the, the conclusion and in how we frame the discussion. Uh, you also mentioned putting the conclusion up front. So we have a digest that basically um, is a is a reiteration or the first the first time we we make the point of what our conclusion is. So before so it's in the first I don't know if you have in front of you it, it's the first page of the opinion. It has an issue and then it has a digest and the digest is essentially the conclusion before you then get into the analysis. As for the um, this uh, philosophy of having shorter opinions, I actually. Um, I, I totally hear what you're saying. This, this, believe it or not, is one of our shorter opinions um, over the last couple of years. You know, as I think some other folks pointed out, we've had opinions 15, 16, 17 pages long. And I think when you, um, when we, we take out the, the red line aspects of this, uh, and which will shorten it even further, you're looking at about a 10 page opinion, at least for me, Philosophically, I'd love to be a 10 page or so less all the time. So I think I think we fit that bill with how this is. And it's it also, I think, reads pretty easily. One of the challenges when we get super long with these opinions is it's so dense and it can be really hard to keep track of what the point is. At least I feel like with the page length that we have on this one and how it reads, it's easier to digest for the audience relative to some of the um more complicated opinions that we've published over the last few years. And so I think it's it's pretty well manicured. That's not to say that we shouldn't continue to manicure it and chop a sentence here or there if it's going to help for the final product. Um, but I think at least for purposes of sending it to public comment, um, I'm comfortable personally with the page length and how it's reading, but, but keeping in mind that we would still want to continue to refine it non-substantively to, to see if we can continue to make it as readable as possible. So that's kind of my my kind of response, if you will, to, to your helpful comments. Thank you, Justin. I, I, do, I guess I have a cool, another follow-on question. So we don't have a role, so we're gonna do an opinion. Is there, a circumstance where we would feel so strongly about something that we would suggest moving something to a rule and how would we do that? So I heard I heard the, the rationale why we wouldn't, yet is there a way to do, how, how would we do that? In other words, this could be one, if there's a way to do it that makes sense, that I feel strongly enough to say, hey, then we don't have it, but we should have it. And so I don't know if that's a justing question or not even a question for today. Um, but what that when I heard you, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Just yeah, well, like 8.3, 8. right? We didn't have a role, but there came a time when 
we decided we should have one over. Yeah, I guess, well, I'm on the hot seat right now. I can I just quickly chime in and say, I mean, obviously there's a legislative or rulemaking process that goes on and, and changes are made from time to time. And, and this committee has the opportunity to weigh in sometimes when we're, we're asked to provide input on, on potential rule, um, rule revisions. Um, that being said, given where we are, what the lay of the land is today, today what we can do is try to get as, as much guidance out there to lawyers um, given the landscape of the rules. And so I think this opinion is um, gives us that best opportunity given that there, there isn't a, a rule mandating succession planning. And so this is the, this is the step as far as, as we can go to, to try to get that guidance out. Maybe someday that'll change and and someone will spearhead a, a change in the rules. But given where we are today, um, you know, this, this is, I think, um, our best shot to get that guidance out. So it's eerily silent. Uh, do we want to do we want to take a vote to send this out to public comment? Do we want to hold it for a month? Sarah, I'm, in favor, I'm in favor of voting it out to public comment. Same here. In fact, if you're looking for a motion, Same. I'll make the motion to vote it out. I'll second. second. Do I have Bill as a second, or was that Dan? Yeah, I yeah, be it Bill. Okay, thank you. So I'll take the vote um, for twenty triple two to go out for public comment. Bacon, yes. Brown, yes. Bradley, Chivers, yes. Krieger, Bradley, yes. Bradley, yes. Thank you. Krieger, Mark, yes. Mercado, Munoz, yes. O'Reilly? Yes. Poindexter? Yes. Starr? Yes. Vanola? Yes. The motion carries. OK. So at first, I thought my prediction wasn't going to work out that we would <laughs> end early because uh, I allocated too much time to the uh, second half of the agenda <laughs> for certain items. But it, it seems to, that we might end early. That was the last item on our agenda for today. Um, although I do expect we'll have a, a fully packed agenda for our next meeting, which is on June 23rd um, at the same time. And that's also going to take place remotely. Um, but maybe we can separately brainstorm about if there's a way to, I, I really did like Joel's suggestion of the benefits of getting together in person. I know it makes it more difficult for travel, but if there's some way to have a, some local place where members could go that's publicly noticed, um, I think that might be useful. Um, anything else before we conclude today's meeting? Uh, yeah, just real quick. You know, uh, on the main agenda item E8 was about expert witnesses and retainers. Cassidy, have you found anything further since the last message I sent you from Steve at the State Bar? No, I'm sorry. I was like, oh God, I forgot about that, Joel. <laughs> so let me take a look at that again. I got to circle back on that and then well, um, let's well, do that because for the rest of the committee, uh, when I was putting together the uh, seminar program on the Girardi thing, I talked to Steve, uh, I can't remember his last name. Moad, Moad, yeah, yeah. And I said, I said, hey, since I've got you, do you, do you got any opinion about what attorneys who are experts have about handling them in a trust fund or not? And he said, well, go ask Erica. He said, right. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so I don't know where to go. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. We can maybe take this off the agenda if you don't come back to us with anything else, Cassidy. Okay, yeah, let, let me just spend a little bit of time on it and then I'll shoot you an email to, you know, gather my thoughts and, and then we can decide whether or not to put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Thanks, okay. Th thanks, Joel. And, and actually, you just reminded me of, of one point I, I wanted to make 
to everyone is just, I know that we, we have a lot of items that were on the assignment agenda that we didn't get to today um, because we didn't have the um, assignments turned in um, prior to this meeting. And I, I understand everyone gets busy, but <laughs> so I'm not <laughs> um, criticizing anyone, but I'm just, the one thing I would like people to do is just to evaluate if you're on a working group where the opinion is in its very early stages, like issue spotting or, or outline, and you feel that it might not be something that we want to pursue, um, I, I think that would be helpful to know too, because there's some that I feel like are on the very early stages where they've just been, no progress has been made. And I'm not sure of the reason if it's just because we're getting busy, but if, if it might be because it's just not a topic of interest or we feel like it's not um, of significant importance, then I think we should consider removing it to make room for, for other um, new opinions that we've discussed earlier today. So that's all. But thanks, everyone, and hope you enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Go Warriors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At the very end, when everyone's leaving, so they can't all comment. Have a good night. <laughs>